section one of days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by sue anderson days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 by sarah raymond herndon dedicated to the pioneers of montana and the great west who crossed the plains in wagons preface i do not expect to gain fame or fortune by the publication of this little book i have prepared it for publication because a number of the pioneers who read my journal twenty years ago when published in the husbandman have asked me to at that time i was a busy wife mother and housekeeper and could only write when my baby boy was taking his daily nap to supply the copy for each week no one knows better than i how very imperfect it was yet many seemed to enjoy it and the press that noticed it at all spoke very kindly of it sarah raymond herndon we start may first eighteen sixty five as i sit here in the shade of our prairie schooner with this blank book ready to record the events of this our first day on the road the thought comes to me why are we here why have we left home friends relatives associates and loved ones who have made so large a part of our lives and added so much to our happiness echo answers why the chief aim in life is the pursuit of life liberty and happiness are we not taking great risks in thus venturing into the wilderness when devoted men and women leave home friends and the enjoyments of life to go to some far heathen land obeying the command go preach my gospel to every creature we look on and applaud and desire to emulate them there is something so sublime so noble in the act that elevates the missionary above the common order of human beings that we are not surprised that they make the sacrifice and we silently wish that we too had been called to do missionary work but when people who are comfortably and pleasantly situated pull up stakes and leave all or nearly all that makes life worth the living start on a long tedious and perhaps dangerous journey to seek a home in a strange land among strangers with no other motive than that of bettering their circumstances by gaining wealth and heaping together riches that perish with the using it does seem strange that so many people do it the motive does not seem to justify the inconvenience the anxiety the suspense that must be endured yet how would the great west be peopled were it not so god knows best it is without doubt this spirit of restlessness and unsatisfied longing or ambition if you please which is implanted in our nature by an all-wise creator that has peopled the whole earth this has been a glorious may day the sky most beautifully blue the atmosphere delightfully pure the birds twittering joyously the earth seems filled with joy and gladness god has given us this auspicious day to inspire our hearts with hope and joyful anticipation this our first day's journey on the road across the plains and mountains it was hard to say good-bye to our loved and loving friends knowing that we were not at all likely to meet again in this life i felt very much like indulging in a good cry but refrained and dick and i were soon speeding over the beautiful prairie overtaking cash 
who had lingered behind the others waiting for me a penny for your thoughts cash i was wondering if we will ever tread missouri soil again quite likely we shall we are young in years with a long life before us no doubt we will come on a visit to missouri when we get rich we were passing a very comfortable looking farmhouse men women and children were in the yard gazing after us as we cantered past don't you believe they envy us and wish they were going too no why should they oh because it is so jolly to be going across the continent it is like a picnic every day for months i was always sorry picnic days were so short and now it will be an all-summer picnic i wish i felt that way aren't you sorry to leave your friends of course i am but then i shall write long letters to them and they will write to me and i will make new friends wherever i go and somehow i am glad i am going after we came within sight of our caravan we walked our ponies and talked of many things past present and future when within a mile or two of memphis our first camp was made our six wagons with their snow-white covers and mr kerfoot's big tent made a very respectable looking camp our first camp as we were provided with fresh bread cake cold chicken boiled ham pickles preserves etc supper was quickly prepared for our small family of four and we enjoyed it immensely then comes my time to write as i have promised friends that i will keep a journal on this trip mr kerfoot thinks the government is going to smash and greenbacks will not be worth one cent on the dollar so he has turned all his money into gold coin and stowed it into a small leather satchel it seems quite heavy to lift or carry as mrs kerfoot was sitting on a camp chair near our wagons mr kerfoot came toward her saying here mother i want you to take care of this satchel it is all we will ask you to do the girls will cook and wash dishes the boys take care of the stock and i will oversee things generally and we will do nicely she accepted the responsibility without a word and as he walked away she turned to me and said i wish it was in some good bank i expect nothing else but that it will be stolen and then what will become of us while i have been writing neelie cornelia and city henrietta have been getting supper for a family of twelve no small undertaking for them as they have been used to servants and know very little about cooking when everything was ready neelie came to her mother exclaiming come mamma to supper the first ever prepared by your own little girl but not the last i hope see how nicely the table looks emma and delia picked those wild flowers for you how brightly the new tinware shines let it imagine it is silver and it will answer the same purpose as if it were her mother smiles cheerfully as she takes her arm cash sneers at neelie's nonsense as she calls it mr kerfoot nods approval as neelie escorts her mother to the table when all are seated mr kerfoot bows his head and asks god's blessing on the meal everyone seems to enjoy this picnic style of taking supper out of doors and lingers so long at the table that neelie has to hint that other work will have to be done before dark when at last the table is cleared she says to emma and delia don't you want to help me wash these nice bright dishes and put them away they are always ready to help neelie and the work is soon done amid laughter and fun they hardly realize they have been at work mr kerfoot insists 
that we women and the children must sleep in houses as long as there are houses to sleep in mother and i would greatly prefer sleeping in our spring wagon to making a bed on the floor in a room with so many but as he has hired the room and we do not want to seem contrary so have offered no objection the boys have carried the mattresses and bedding into the house and neelie has come for me to go with her to arrange our sleeping room so good night through memphis tuesday may second we were up with the sun this morning after a night of refreshing and restful sleep neelie and i commenced folding the bedclothes ready to be sent to the wagons when she startled me with a merry peal of laughter <laughs> look here miss sally see ma's treasure she has left it on the floor under the head of her bed don't say anything and i will put it in the bottom of a trunk where it ought to be and we will see how long it will be before she misses it she thought of it while at breakfast and started up excitedly neely daughter did you see that precious satchel yes ma i have taken care of it and put it where it will not be left lying around loose any more thank you my dear i am glad you have taken care of it why mother i did not expect you to carry that burden around on your arm by day and sleep with it at night i only intend for you to have entire charge of it and put it where the rest of us do not know the hiding place so that when we are obliged to have some we will have to come to you and get it and then give it sparingly for much very much depends upon what is in that satchel i meet an acquaintance we came to memphis about nine a m court is in session several friends and acquaintances who are attending court came to the wagons to say good-bye mother's brother uncle zack was among them he said remember when you wish yourselves back here that i told you not to go yes we will when that times comes and send you a vote of thanks for your good advice i replied cash neely and i have been riding our ponies all day we are stopping in a beautiful place for camping near the farmhouse of a mr and mrs pfeiffer they are very pleasant elderly people who have raised a family of six children who are all married and gone to homes of their own it is a delightfully homey home yet it seems sad that they should be left alone in their old age we will sleep in the house again tonight i shall be glad when we get to where there are no houses to sleep in for it does not seem like camping out when we sleep in houses cash and neely want to sleep in the tent but their father says no and his word is law in this camp wednesday may third brother hillhouse discovered very early this morning that the tire on one of the wheels of the ox wagon was broken he started off ahead of the rest of the wagons to find a blacksmith shop and get it mended by the time we would overtake him it was ten o'clock when we came to the shop near a flour mill there was a very bad piece of road before we crossed the creek a deep ditch which had been washed out by the spring rains i waited to see the wagon safely over when someone came up beside my pony with outstretched hand saying good morning miss raymond i see you are in earnest about crossing the plains why how do you do mr smith I am glad to see you of course i am in earnest about crossing the plains but where did you come from i supposed you would be at the missouri river before this time have you turned back oh no we are waiting for better roads and good company come go with us i will promise you good company and the roads will improve where are cash and neely i have not seen them 
they did not stop when i waited to see the wagons over the difficulties then i have missed seeing them was in the mill when they passed remember me to them we will start again tomorrow and will overtake you in a few days perhaps hope you will good-bye until we again farewell may you enjoy as pleasant a trip as you anticipate thank you and waving him good-bye i spoke to dick and he cantered up the hill past the mill and the wagons i soon caught up with cash and neely guess who i saw at the mill did you see any one we know yes and a special friend of yours cash bob smith of liberty oh dear i wish i had seen him was that harper with him are they going back home no they are waiting for better roads and good company i did not see thad harper bob said they would overtake us in a few days i hope they will they would be quite an addition to our party an addition to our party yes but they won't do you suppose they are going to let us see them cooking and washing dishes not if they know themselves then they would have to play the agreeable once in a while and that is what they are not going to do on a trip of this kind i do not expect to see them they would rather stay where they are another week than join our party i believe you are right neely for he did not say good-bye as if he expected to see me very soon when it was time to stop for lunch we found a very nice place and waited for the wagons while at lunch we saw an emigrant wagon drawn by three yoke of oxen coming up the road and were somewhat surprised to see it turn from the road and come toward our camp it proved to be mr john milburn of etna and his sister augusta they have travelled in one day and a half the distance we have been two and a half days coming miss milburn is a very intelligent well-educated young lady some two or three years my senior we are not very well acquainted with her but have met her frequently and have known of her several years she is an active member of the presbyterian church of etna she has her little nephew ernest talbot with her he is seven years old her sister's dying gift a very bright child and considerably spoiled but dear to his auntie's heart as her own life they have started to montana to get rich in the gold mines mr milburn leaves a wife and two small children with his widowed mother to watch and wait and pray for his success and safe return home we crossed the dividing line though we did not see it between missouri and iowa soon after noon and it is very probable some of us will never tread missouri soil again as we were coming through stilesville a small town this side of the line there were several loafers in front of a saloon who acted very rudely to say the least we distinctly heard such remarks as the following Phew, what pretty girls and how well they ride missourians i'll bet say boys let's try our luck maybe we can each hook a pony tonight mr milburn's team is so tired out with such fast driving that we have stopped earlier than usual and i have more time to write we are only two or three miles from stilesville the weather is perfect we will sleep in the wagons tonight mr kerfoot thinks it necessary to guard the camp i believe it an unnecessary precaution for if those loafers at stilesville had meant mischief they would not have expressed themselves so freely however ezra and frank kerfoot mr kerfoot's nephews sim buford and brother hillhouse will take turns standing guard each one for two hours thursday may fourth oh how we did sleep last night dreamless and sound 
our first night in the wagons was undisturbed and sweet we were up with the birds making ready for an early start mother prepares breakfast while i roll up the beds and cover closely to protect them from the dust one of the boys milks the cows while i assist mother and when breakfast of hot biscuit ham and eggs applesauce coffee and breakfast food which i should have mentioned first is over i strain the milk into an old-fashioned churn that is big at the bottom and little at the top cover closely and fix it in the front of the freight wagon where it will be churned by the motion of the wagon and we have a pat of the sweetest most delicious butter when we stop in the evening that anyone ever tasted mother washes the dishes we prepare lunch for our noon meal i stow it in the grub box under the seat of the spring wagon the boys take the pipe off the little sheet iron stove empty the fire out and leave it to cool while i am putting things away in the places where they belong it is wonderful how soon we have learned to live in a wagon and we seem to have an abundance of room when horses are harnessed oxen yoked and everything ready to start we girls proceed to saddle our ponies some of the boys usually come and offer assistance which is politely declined as we are going to wait upon ourselves on this trip the wagons start leaving us to follow at our leisure we don our riding habits made of dark brown denim that completely cover and protect us from mud and dust tie on our sunbonnets mount our ponies unassisted and soon overtake and pass the wagons we started this morning at seven o'clock it is delightful riding horseback in the early morning end of section one section two of days on the road crossing the plains in eighteen sixty five by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain bloomfield iowa we were on the lookout for bloomfield about ten o'clock we could see the spires and steeples glittering in the sunshine when we reached the suburbs we stopped to wait for the wagons when we reached the business part of the city i dismounted and made ready to do some shopping as a few necessary articles had been forgotten when purchasing our outfit aren't you going with me girls oh dear no not in these togs short dresses thick shoes sunbonnets etc i think we appear much better in our short dresses thick shoes and sunbonnets than we would in trailing skirts french kid shoes and hats of the latest style especially as we are emigrants and not ladies at home however i do not wish you to suffer mortification on my account some one of the boys will go with me may i go miss sally ezra asked certainly and thank you too we called at two drug stores one grocery and several dry goods establishments and made several small purchases the clerk seemed quite interested and asked numerous questions some wished they were going too others thought we had a long hard journey before us when we came back they were waiting for us i gave the satchel containing the purchases into mother's care mounted dick and we were soon on the way about a mile from bloomfield we stopped for lunch of sandwiches gingerbread cheese fruit and milk we all have such ravenous appetites the plainest food is relished and enjoyed as we never enjoyed food before if any one suffering from loss of appetite or insomnia would take a trip of this kind they would soon find their appetite and sleep the night through without waking brother winthrop wanted to ride dick this afternoon so i took passage with mother and drove the horses until i began to nod 
when i gave the lines to her and climbed back into the wagon for an afternoon nap i waked up as we were driving into drakesville a small but very pretty town mother and i talked the rest of the afternoon she enjoys this life as much as i do we built air castles for our future habitation i trust there was not enough selfishness in the building material to hurt us if they tumble about our ears mother seems happier than she has since the war commenced and our eldest brother mac went into the army we stopped for the night earlier than usual about five o'clock we are camping in a lane near a farmhouse our little sheet iron stove is taken down from its place on a shelf at the back of the freight wagon mother gets dinner and prepares something for lunch tomorrow at the same time the boys buy feed from the farmers as the grass is not long enough to satisfy the horses and cattle i write as long as it is light enough to see the young people complain about my taking so much time to write but since i have commenced i cannot stop i am thinking all the time about what things are worth recording a call to dinner beautiful apples after dinner mother washes the dishes and makes all the arrangements she can for an early breakfast she thinks i am another harriet beecher stowe so she is perfectly willing to do the work in the evening and let me write oh the unselfishness of mothers i do my share of course mornings and at noon but evenings i only make the beds in both wagons we have white sheets and pillowcases with a pair of blankets and light comforts on both beds just the same as at home and they do not soil any more or any quicker as we have them carefully protected from dust i had been writing a little while after dinner when frank stepped up with a basket of beautiful red-cheeked apples in his hand not a wilted one among them where shall i put them oh frank how lovely they are where did you get them thank you so much they are not all for me as he emptied the last one into the pan are all the others supplied this seems more than my share yes they are for you we bought the farmer's entire stock the others are supplied or will be without you giving them yours he had just gone when sim buford came and threw half a dozen especially beautiful ones into my lap thank you sim but i am bountifully supplied don't you see so you are but keep mine too i can guess who it was that forestalled me laughing as he walked off so we are feasting on luscious apples this evening thanks to the generosity of our young gentlemen friday may fifth we came through unionville and moravia today have traveled further and later than any day yet it was almost dark when we stopped and raining too to make a bad matter worse we are camping in a disagreeable muddy place and have to use lanterns to cook by we were obliged to come so far to get a lot large enough to hold the stock we will be glad to sleep in the house tonight mrs kerfoot is homesick blue and despondent this evening she has always had such an easy life that anything disagreeable discourages her perhaps when the sun shines again she will feel all right saturday may sixth this morning dawned clear and bright all nature seemed refreshed by yesterday's rain and we started joyfully on our journey once more we came through iconium early in the day are camping in lucas county near a beautiful farmhouse we expect to stay here until monday as we do not intend to travel on sundays it is a beautiful moonlight night someone proposes a walk as cash is giving winthrop his first lessons in flirtation they of course go together 
sim and neelie miss milburn and ezra are the next to start and frank is waiting to go with me hill stays in camp in conversation with mr kerfoot and mr milburn he is more like an old man than the boy he is not twenty yet after we had gone a short distance miss milburn asked to be excused and returned to camp ezra of course going with her we walked on for a mile or more enjoying the beautiful moonlight and having lots of fun as happy young people will have when we returned and i had said good night to the others i climbed into the wagon to finish my writing for the day by the light of the lantern the front of mr milburn's wagon almost touches the back of ours forming an angle i had been riding a few moments when i heard sobbing i was out in a jiffy and had gone to the front of their wagon without stopping to think whether i was intruding may i come in i asked as i stepped upon the wagon tongue oh yes come in miss sally but i am ashamed to let you see me crying somehow i could not help it i felt so lonely and homesick i am sorry you feel lonely and homesick did any of us say or do anything this evening that could have hurt you oh no not at all only i always feel that i am one too many when i am with you all you seem so light-hearted and happy so free from care so full of life and fun that i feel that i am a damper to your joyousness for i cannot get over feeling homesick and sad especially when night comes how sweetly ernest sleeps and how much he seems to enjoy this manner of life yes he is a great comfort to me as well as a great care he is dearer to me than to any one else in the world his father seems to be weaned from him since they have been separated so long he has not seen him more than half a dozen times since his mother died i feel that he is altogether mine may god help me to train him for heaven he will never know what i have sacrificed for him i have a mind to tell you if you care to hear why i am here and why i am not happy it may perhaps relieve you and lighten the burden to share it and then she told me what i will record to-morrow for it is almost midnight and mother has been asleep for two hours and i must hie me to bed miss milburn's love story of course you have heard about my engagement to jim miller i know it has been talked about yes i have heard the matter discussed we have been engaged two years and were to be married next month he insisted that i must give up ernest to my mother i felt that i would be violating a sacred trust and that mother is too old to have the care of such a child and i told him so we quarreled and while i was feeling hurt and indignant i told brother john i would go with him to montana he gladly accepted my offer and his wife was so glad john would have someone to take care of him if he got sick so here i am and i know i ought not to have come for jim miller is dearer to me than my own life i am so sorry for you yet i believe that in some way it will be for the best you know the promise all things work together for good to those who love the lord i will try to believe it you have done me good miss sally i am glad you came come again sunday may seventh remember the sabbath day to keep it holy have we obeyed this command today i fear not we are all or very nearly all professing christians yet we have had no public worship in our camp today but we have all to some extent desecrated the day by work deeds of mercy and necessity may be done on the sabbath day without sin and mother says 
it is very necessary that our soiled clothes sheets and pillowcases should be washed and that cleanliness is next to godliness the question comes to me why is it that christians are so loath to talk of the things that pertain to their spiritual life and eternal welfare why so backward about introducing a service of worship when so well aware it would meet with the approval of all i felt that mr kerfoot was the one to suggest a service of prayer and praise and reading the scriptures perhaps he thought some of the ladies would mention it so all were silent and it is numbered with the lost opportunities for doing something for our lord and master may he pardon our sins of omission and may we be permitted to atone for the manner in which we spent our first sabbath on this trip we have not traveled so our teams have rested and done no labor if we have violated the commandment ourselves the weather is perfect this is another beautiful moonlight night the young ladies and gentlemen have gone for another walk in the same order as last night except frank went with miss milburn and ezra is waiting for me a letter to brother mac monday may eighth i left camp very early and walked on alone that i may write to brother mac before the wagons overtake me i am seated in a comfortable fence corner and here goes for my letter lucas county iowa may eighth eighteen sixty five dear brother we were delayed several days after the time set for starting when we wrote you to meet us at council bluffs by the tenth we thought i would better write that you may know we are on the way and hope to meet you by the fifteenth or the sixteenth you must possess your soul with patience if you get there before we do and have to wait i could write a long letter i have so much to tell you but we'll wait until we meet mother seems in better health and spirits than she has since you went into the army we are enjoying the trip very much and i find myself feeling sorry for the people that have to stay at home and cannot travel and camp out Goodbye until next week with sincerest love your sister sarah the wagons are coming in sight just as my letter is finished and addressed and ready to mail at the next post office my pony is in harness today as one of the workhorses is a little lame so i will have to ride in the wagon or walk as the morning is so fine i will walk until i begin to tire evening cash joined me in my walk and we walked until noon how wisely planned are these physical bodies of ours how easily inured to the burdens they must bear before we started on this trip such a walk as we took this morning would have completely prostrated us now we did not feel any inconvenience from the unusual exercise frank invited us cash and i to ride in his wagon this afternoon we accepted the invitation and made an emigrant visit he had arranged his wagon for our convenience and comfort and we spent a very pleasant afternoon frank mailed my letter at cheriton and on his way back bought candy and nuts for a treat for his visitors which we of course enjoyed exceedingly i should not care to ride in an ox wagon all the way across the plains but for half a day once in a while it is a pleasant change especially when so delightfully entertained the afternoon passed quickly we are camping near a large party of emigrants some of the men came to our camp they look tough they are from pike county missouri on their way to oregon tuesday may ninth a beautiful day for horseback riding until late this afternoon when it commenced blowing a perfect gale too severe to travel so we drove into camp early we came through ottawa and osceola are camping in clark county wednesday may tenth 
a very cold day for this time of year too cold to think of riding horseback so we all took passage in the wagons as we have plenty to read and lots of visiting to do it is no hardship to ride in the wagon for a day the boys have made a splendid campfire and we are getting thawed out cheered and ready for a jolly evening there was just one stunted oak left standing away out here in this great expanse of prairie for our especial benefit it seems the boys cut it down and taking the trunk for a back log the top and branches to build the fire we have a glorious campfire away out here in union county iowa it is surprising to find iowa so sparsely settled we travel sometimes half a day and do not see a home there are always a few farms near the towns the settlements are the only breaks in the monotonous landscape oh the tedious tiresome monotony of these vast extended prairies to look out and away over these seemingly endless levels as far as the eye can reach and see only grass grass everywhere with beautiful prairie flowers of course but the flowers cannot be seen in the distance no earthly consideration would induce me to make a home on any of these immense prairie levels how my eyes long for a sight of beautiful trees and running streams of water how delightful to stroll in the woods once more thursday may eleventh the wish expressed last evening is realized in a manner we are camping in a strip of timber along the banks of a creek or branch rather but then it is such a slow-going stream not at all limpid clear or sparkling as a brook ought to be it can hardly be called a running stream for it goes too slowly i think creeping or crawling would be more appropriate we came through afton today end of section two section three of days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain the Icarian Community Friday, May 12th Brother Hillhouse's birthday He is 20 years old We made a birthday cake for him last night We divided it into 20 pieces at lunch today And there was just enough to go around And leave two pieces for himself The girls say we must have some kind of jollification tonight I hope they will leave me out for I want to write about the Icarian community. We came through Queen City this morning, and this afternoon came to a town of French people called the Icarian community. Called to dinner. Later, they have excused me. But why Icarian? I cannot understand, for certainly they did not impress me as high flyers, neither as flyers at all they seemed the most humdrum slow going even tenor all dressed alike folks i have ever seen every dwelling is exactly alike log cabins of one room with one door one window a fireplace with stick chimney i rode close by the open doors of some of the houses and tried to talk with the women but we could not understand each other at all the floors windows and everything in the houses were scrupulously clean but not one bit of brightness or color not a thread of carpet or a rug and all the women's and girls dresses made of heavy blue denim with white kerchiefs around the shoulders and pinned across the front of the waist the skirt above the ankles and very narrow and heavy thick-soled shoes the men and boys all looked alike too but i did not observe them closely enough to describe them 
there are several large long buildings one with a large bell in belfry on top of building they are dining room town hall schoolhouse and two others i did not learn what they are used for all the buildings are one story of the plainest architecture for the one purpose of shelter from sun and storm there is not a thing to ornament or beautify not a shade tree or flower yet everything men women children houses yards and streets are as clean as they can be made they are peaceable law-abiding citizens live entirely independent of the people of adjoining neighborhoods they are supposed to be wealthy the town is the center of well-cultivated and well-stocked farms the principle upon which the community is founded is brotherly love a sort of cooperative communism in which all things are the common property of all they live upon what their farms produce have vast herds of cattle and sheep a fine site for their town and seem the picture of contentment which is better than riches we stopped within sight of quincy and another camping outfit we soon learned they are mr harding and mr morrison and family from lewis county we are acquainted with mr harding and have often heard of the morrisons mr morrison and mr harding came over and the men have had a sociable gossiping time this evening the men can surpass the women gossiping any time notwithstanding the general belief to the contrary the young folks have been playing games to celebrate hillhouse's birthday they had hard work to get him to join them. A Swing Among the Trees Saturday, May 13th We drove only until noon and stopped to stay over Sunday so that we can do our washing and baking without violating the Sabbath. We do not have collars and cuffs and fine starched things to do up, but we have a great many pocket handkerchiefs aprons stockings etc we have pretty bead collars made of black and white beads tied with a ribbon that always look nice and do not get soiled we are in a beautiful grove of trees the boys have put up a swing there is nothing in the way of play that i enjoy as i do a good high swing there are plenty of boys to swing us as high as we want to go I fear the Sabbath will be desecrated with play tomorrow, if not with work, for the temptation to swing will be hard to resist. Sunday, May 14th. The horses went off two or three miles last night. The men were all off bright and early this morning hunting them. Mr. Kerfoot found them and came back about nine o'clock by the time they were all here the morning's work was finished and we were ready for what a day to spend in rest and service for the master oh no a day spent in swinging frivolous conversation and fun i am ashamed to tell it but it is nevertheless true and i believe we all thought less about a service of worship than we did last sunday it is so hard to get right if we do not start right we have visitors in camp tonight two gentlemen from clark county neighbors of the kerfoots mr souter and mr rain they started for the gold mines in montana two or three weeks ago after reaching the missouri river they heard such frightful stories of Indian depredations being committed on the plains that they sold their outfit for what they could get and are returning home on horseback. Poor fellows, how I pity any man that has so little grit. I should think they would be ashamed to show their faces to their neighbors and say, we were afraid, so we came back home i believe mrs kerfoot is the only one of our party who would be willing to turn back 
and perhaps she would not if it were put to the test we would not like to be scalped and butchered by the indians but it does seem so cowardly to run away from a possible danger the everlasting arms are underneath god can and will take care of us on the plains as anywhere he is leading us through unknown paths we can trust him heaven is as near one place as another our second sunday has not been much of an improvement on our first the first we worked today we have played the boys swung us all morning until we were ready to holler nuff we had sunday dinner between two and three o'clock then we wrote letters to friends at home read until sleepy took a nap of an hour then mr souter and mr rain came and we listened to their frightful stories of what the indians are doing to emigrants i left them in disgust to come and record our misdoings of this our second sunday on the road it is almost bedtime and i must make the beds for we are early to bed and early to rise while on this trip a fatal accident monday may fifteenth alas alas how can i write the disastrous happenings of this day my hand trembles and my pencil refuses to write intelligibly when i attempt to record the sad oh so sad accident that has befallen us we parted from our visitors this morning and started on our way feeling rested and glad to be journeying on again how little we knew of what a day would bring forth we stopped for lunch at noon in a little vale or depression on the prairie but where there was no water just as we had finished our lunch neelie came she said to see if we could make an exchange for the afternoon her mother riding with mine and i with the young folks in the family wagon of course it was soon arranged and i told her i would come as soon as i helped mother put things away we sometimes visit in this way mrs kerfoot soon came around and when everything was ready i started to go to their wagon it was the last one in the train as i was passing mr milburn's wagon he called to me to come and get a drink of water he had taken a long walk and found clear pure water not very cold but much better than none at all i gratefully accepted a cup he and his sister then invited me to ride with them i told them of my engagement with neelie and of course they excused me oh that i had accepted their invitation just such a little thing as that might have prevented this dreadful accident such great events turn on such little hinges sometimes about three o'clock in the afternoon as we were plodding along after the fashion of emigrant teams we young people in the last wagon having a jolly sociable time with song and laughter fun and merriment the front wagon stopped ezra who was driving turned out of the road and passed some of the wagons to see what the trouble was mr kerfoot came running toward us calling to neelie get the camphor daughter mr milburn has shot himself somehow and has fainted ezra got out to go with him and neelie asked shall we come too papa no my daughter you girls would better stay here your ma and mrs raymond are with gus and they will know what to do before he had finished what he was saying they were running to the place of the accident we could only wait hoping and praying oh so earnestly that it might not prove so serious as mr kerfoot's manner and tone caused us to fear afterward winthrop came to us he was pale with compressed lips and sad eyes he came up close leaned upon the wagon wheel and said in a low tone he is dead oh how dreadful we all left the wagon 
and went to the front as fast as we could i have gathered from witnesses the following account of how it happened there was a flock of prairie chickens ahead of the wagons to the left of the road mr milburn and several of the boys took their guns and were going to try to thin their number the wagons had not halted but were moving slowly on the hunters had gone on a little in advance of the wagons they tried to fire all together one of the boys snapped two caps on his gun it failed to go off so he threw the gun into the front wagon and took his whip in disgust the wagon had moved on to where mr milburn was standing with his gun raised there was a shot mr milburn dropped to his knees turned and looked at his sister saying gus i am shot and fell forward on his face she was in the next wagon bereavement gus screamed and jumped from the wagon ran to her brother and raised his head in her arms all who were near enough to hear her scream ran to them and she said john has hurt himself with his gun and has fainted bring restoratives quick in a few seconds there were half a dozen bottles with brandy camphor ammonia there and every effort was made to restore him but all in vain he died instantly and without a struggle when mr kerfoot knew he was dead he looked for the wound and found a bullet hole between his shoulders just then one of the boys picked up his gun where he had dropped it and exclaimed it was not this gun that did the mischief for it is cold and the load is in it on looking around to find where the deadly shot had come from someone took hold of the gun in the front wagon why this gun is warm it must have been this gun went off oh no it could not have been that gun for there was no cap on it said the boy who had thrown the gun there circumstances proved that it was the gun without a cap that did the fatal shooting i would have supposed as the boy did that it was perfectly harmless without a cap i have heard it said it is the unloaded gun or the one that is supposed to be unloaded that generally does the mischief no doubt the hammer was thrown back when he threw it in the wagon on investigating we found a rut in the wheel track just where he fell it is possible that when the front wheel dropped into the rut with a jolt the hammer fell igniting the powder either by the combustible matter that stuck or by the flash occasioned by the metal striking together mr milburn was not opposite the wagon when he raised his gun to shoot but the wagons were moving slowly and the front one came up with him as he was taking aim and that was why gus thought it was his own gun she saw the smoke rise he stumbled and fell to his knees she called to him why john what made you fall he looked around at her and said oh gus i am shot the last words he spoke how hard to be reconciled to such a dispensation when such a little thing could have prevented it only one step in either direction or the gun pointed the other way why oh why has this awful thing happened the poor boy seems to be as heart-stricken as gus in her unselfish grief she has been trying to comfort him i have read of a minister of the gospel who dreamed that he died after entering the gates of heaven he was led into a large empty room on the walls of which his whole life was spread out as a panorama he saw all the events of his life and many that had been hard to understand in his lifetime were here made clear and through it all the guiding protecting hand of god had been over him perhaps mr milburn is saved from a worse fate we were about three miles from frankfort when the accident happened we came on here as soon as possible a sorrowing and oh so sorrowful procession now 
it does not seem that we can ever be the merry party that we have been winthrop had been riding dick he stood there ready saddled and bridled when mr milburn fell frank mounted my pony and rode as fast as he could go to frankfort to get a doctor mr milburn was dead before he was out of sight we met them as we came a room has been rented and mr milburn prepared for his last long sleep the people of frankfort are very kind and sympathetic a funeral tuesday may sixteenth the boys sat up with the corpse last night i stayed with gus we had only just shut ourselves in when a terrific storm came upon us the wind blew and the rain fell in torrents before eleven o'clock it had passed and soon after gus slept heavily it seemed hours before i slept very early this morning gus awakened me praying how surely do the sorrows of this life drive us to the mercy seat for comfort refuge and strength had earth no thorns among its flowers and life no fount of tears we might forget our better home beyond this veil of tears what a precious what a comforting satisfying faith the presbyterian faith must be if one can really and conscientiously accept it according to their belief one never dies nothing ever happens without god's providence approval and foreknowledge that it will happen in just that way i wish i could accept such a faith and believe it but i cannot i do not believe it was ordained that mr milburn should die in that way and at that time i believe it was an accident that might have been prevented by the most trivial circumstance the laws of nature are inexorable if a bullet is shot into a vital part of the body it kills yet god is able to bring good out of this seemingly great and grievous evil i do not know which suffers most the poor boy whose gun did the deed or gus they seem to take comfort in each other's society and are together the most of the time today i am so sorry for both of them the funeral services of the presbyterian church were held at two o'clock this afternoon a resident minister officiating mr milburn was very nicely laid away and his grave marked and enclosed with a neat strong fence before gus and i left the cemetery the people have been so very kind the funeral was largely attended for a stranger in a strange place there is no telegraph office here so we have had to write letters instead of sending telegrams i believe gus's plans are to go with us to the missouri river sell her outfit and return home by steamboat down the missouri river up the mississippi to canton where friends will meet her and go with her to etna wednesday may seventeenth another night with gus she wakes in the morning to weep we started once more on our now sad journey i have ridden with gus all day we do not hear the sound of song and laughter as we did last week we all seem to be under a pall we came through red oak this morning are camping in a beautiful place near a pleasant home-like farmhouse the weather is perfect thursday may eighteenth the friends that stayed with us sunday night told us that the authorities are not allowing emigrants to take the northern route because of the indian depredations that have been committed on that route that if we went to council bluffs we would have to come down the river to plattsmouth to get on the southern route so we changed our course accordingly we came through white cloud glenwood and pacific city today at white cloud i made a few purchases traded with a little german merchant who crossed the plains a year ago he says we have a delightful trip before us 
he expects to go again to the rocky mountains to make his home there as soon as he can sell out and settle up his business here just before we came to glenwood as the girls passed on their ponies gus said to me sally go ride your pony too you have not had a ride in several days pardon me if i have been selfish in my great sorrow no gus i would rather stay with you than to ride dick as long as you need me thank you dear your company has been very grateful to me but now i would really enjoy seeing you ride through glenwood to please her and myself too i soon had saddled and mounted dick and overtaken the girls as we were riding through glenwood a photographer sent a messenger to request us to please stop five minutes and let him take our picture we rode to the position indicated doffed our sunbonnets and looked as pleasant as we could we did not wait to see the proof and i expect he was disappointed pacific city is on the missouri bottom or lowlands above the town are the highest bluffs i have ever seen we hitched our ponies and climbed to the top the view was magnificently grand the sun sinking in the west the river could be seen in the distance with large trees on the banks the lowland between the bluffs and the trees was dotted with cattle and horses grazing here and there a pond or small lake with its waters shining and sparkling in the glimmering sunset the city below us in the shadow of the bluffs everything was so sweet and peaceful we were more than paid for our climb the wagons had passed before we came down so we mounted and hastened to overtake them before driving into camp on the banks of the big muddy our journey across iowa at an end we are on the banks of the big muddy opposite plattsmouth we will stay here until gus's things are sold and we have seen her off on the steamboat i stay with her nights and this afternoon is the first time i have left her since the fifteenth friday may nineteenth i went over to plattsmouth on the ferry boat this morning with some friends that are camping near us to do some shopping for gus i bought a black bonnet crepe veil and collar and material for black suit which we will make up in camp as there is a dressmaker with us i was away about five hours and came back tired and hungry the weather is perfect we have a very pleasant place to camp and pleasant people camping near us we are surrounded on all sides by emigrants camps and still they come it seems like a young town only the houses are built of canvas instead of lumber brick or stone the boys have put up a swing but i have no time for swinging today saturday may twentieth we have had a very very busy day mr kerfoot has sold gus's wagon and team three yoke of oxen for five hundred and fifty dollars a good price everyone says more than they cost them i believe the freight will be sold at auction we have all helped with gus's suit and it is almost finished hillhouse went up to council bluffs this morning expecting to bring brother mac back with him instead of finding him he got a letter also the one i wrote a week ago saying he was not coming he has decided to study medicine and will come west when he is an m d we are disappointed of course yet perhaps it is for the best we must try and believe so anyway most perfect weather the morrison and harding outfit have come also several other families from lewis and clark counties the kerfoots are acquainted with some of them they had heard of the sad accident some of them were friends of mr milburn end of section three section four 
of days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain our last day with miss milburn sunday may 21st mr thatcher and his wife came to call upon gus this afternoon and invited her to their home in plattsmouth to stay until she takes the steamboat for home mr thatcher and mr milburn have been friends for years she accepted their invitation and will go there tomorrow as the people from different camps were sitting around an immense campfire not far from our wagons someone proposed music some of the men in mr clark's camp are fine musicians they brought their violin and flute and gave several instrumental pieces then some familiar songs were sung and someone started just before the battle mother they had sung two verses when i heard a shriek from gus's wagon i hastened to see what was the matter oh sally tell them to please not sing that i cannot bear it dear brother john used to sing it so much it breaks my heart to hear it now i sent winthrop who had followed me to ask them to stop singing poor gus she was more overcome than i have seen her since her bereavement monday may twenty second mr kerfoot cash neely ezra and i came with gus to plattsmouth she said good-bye to mother mrs kerfoot and the others this morning all were sorry to part with her she has become very dear to us all gus's freight was brought over in the wagon and sold at public auction and brought good figures thanks to mr thatcher who when he saw anything going below its real value bid it in himself he has a grocery store he and mr kerfoot have attended to all the business transactions for gus so that she has not been bothered at all and have done better for her than they could have done for themselves we have had a quiet pleasant day with gus at mrs thatcher's home she is very kind and has invited us girls to stay with gus until she takes the boat for home and gus begged us to stay with her as long as possible so cash and i are staying all night and will see her on board the boat tomorrow morning neely has returned to camp with her father and ezra ernest is a great care and worries his auntie he will not stay in the house and she cannot bear to have him out of her sight for fear something will happen to him she has just now undressed him heard his little prayer and put him to bed in the next room so i hope we can have uninterrupted quiet for a while tuesday may twenty third mr and mrs thatcher cash and i came with gus and ernest to the steamboat we parted with them about nine o'clock on board the sioux city dear friend i have become greatly attached to her in the three weeks we have been so intimately associated may god grant her a quick and safe journey home we cannot hope it will be a happy one cash and i came directly to camp after saying good-bye to gus found everyone busy getting ready for an early start tomorrow. we have been here almost a week yet i have not had time to try the fine swing the boys put up the next day after we came here until this afternoon the camps that were here over sunday are all gone except those that will travel with us it is probable there will be half a dozen more camps here before night it is surprising to see what a great number of people are going west this spring we hope to start very early tomorrow morning i trust our party will not be so much like a funeral procession as it has been since the fifteenth vain regrets cannot remedy the past and i believe it is our duty to be as cheerful and happy as possible in this life we have our pictures taken wednesday may twenty fourth we were up with the earliest dawn 
and our own individual outfit ready for a very early start yet it was the middle of the forenoon before all the wagons were landed on the west bank of the missouri it takes a long while to ferry fifteen wagons across the river we girls rode our ponies onto the ferry boat they behaved as if they had been used to ferry boats all their lives as we were waiting near the landing a stranger came apologized for speaking to us and asked are you going to montana no sir our destination is california or oregon we are not fully decided which oh you ought to go to montana that is the place to get rich he told of his marvelous success in that country since eighteen sixty three the indians were mentioned he spoke of them with such contempt said he would rather kill an indian than a good dog says he left a wife and six children in iowa the oldest boy about fourteen who wanted very much to go with his father but his mother needed him last night he came into his father's camp he had run away from home says he is going to montana too his father told it as if he thought it smart and a good joke what sorrow and anxiety his poor mother is no doubt suffering cash neely sim buford ezra frank winthrop and i while waiting in plattsmouth went to a photographer's and had our pictures taken tintype of course all in one group then each one alone then sim and neely together and cash and i on our ponies we only came five miles after our rush to get an early start there are nine families and fifteen wagons in our train now miss mary gatewood has a pony for her especial use so there will be four of us to ride horseback there are enough wagons now to make a respectable corral i did suppose as we had been resting so long we would make a long drive feed for the stock is very good here and as it is fifteen miles to the next good camping place where there is plenty of water and feed it has been decided that we stay here until tomorrow the boys have put up the inevitable swing and we have concluded that what cannot be cured must be endured so we will make the best of it but certainly at this rate we will not reach our destination before it is cold weather thursday may twenty fifth oh dear here we are yet only five miles from plattsmouth morrison and harding have lost two fine cows half a dozen men have been hunting them all day but without success there is not a doubt but that they have been stolen our stock will have to be herded hereafter to guard against thieves we have spent the day reading writing sleeping swinging and getting acquainted with our neighbors the morrison family wagon is just in front of us and the kerfoots just behind so we are able to have the most pleasant neighbors possible to camp next to us mrs morrison is almost as pretty as cash although the mother of four children she is so bright and cheerful so full of life and fun she will be great on a trip like this mr morrison has an impediment in his speech and when he is excited like he is this evening because he cannot find their cows he stutters dreadfully and will say oh sir oh sir oh sir until it is hard to keep from laughing in ordinary conversation and when not excited he talks as straight as any one he seems so fond and proud of his wife and children i like him neely and sim and frank and i took a stroll this afternoon in search of wild flowers they are few and far between yet we enjoyed the walk through the woods in this lovely springtime weather a yankee homestead friday may twenty sixth we came fifteen miles are camping on a high rolling prairie not a tree or shrub within sight we are near a neat white farmhouse 
everything seems to be very new but does not have that lick and promise appearance that so many farmhouses in nebraska have things seem to be shipshape the house completed and nicely painted a new picket fence and everything on the place barns henhouse etc all seem well built as if the owners are expecting to make a permanent home i would prefer a home not quite so isolated and far away from anywhere there do not seem to be any women about the place perhaps they are coming when everything is ready for their comfort saturday may twenty seventh we came to ashland on salt river only a fifteen mile drive got here soon after noon and will stay over sunday several of us young folk went fishing this afternoon i have often gone fishing but do not remember ever catching anything of any consequence or having any luck as the boys say so imagine my excitement and surprise when the fish began to bite and i drew them out almost as fast as i could get my hook baited frank baited my hook and strung the fish on a forked willow switch after i had caught six or eight they seemed so dry and miserable i thought they would feel better in the water so stuck the willow in the bank so that the fish were in shallow water i caught another fish and went to put it with the others when lo they were all gone i could have cried and the rest all laughed well i shall try again after securing the one i had and leaving it on dry ground i threw in my hook and almost immediately i had caught something so large and heavy i could not draw it out and had to call for assistance i was fearful it was a mud turtle or something else than a fish but it proved to be a fine large fish larger than all the small fish i had lost put together when frank had taken it from the hook and strung it with the little one i said now i am going before this fish gets away all had fairly good catches but none that compared with my big fish there are about twenty corrals within sight each of from twelve to twenty wagons ashland is a miserable looking place the houses log cabins with dirt roofs one store where dry goods groceries and whiskey are sold and a blacksmith shop are all the business houses i do not see anything that would pass muster as a hotel sunday may twenty eighth all the trains that camped near us last night except one have gone on their way sunday though it is i am glad there are some people going west who regard the sabbath day some of our young people went fishing and some went rowing on the river in a canoe or small boat the boys hired it has been a day of sweet rest a quiet peaceful sabbath monday may twenty ninth traveled all day and made a long drive without meeting anyone or passing a single habitation we are camping near what the people west of the missouri river call a ranch there is a long low log cabin with dirt roof a corral or enclosure for stock with very high fence and two or three wells of water in the vicinity and that is all no vegetable garden no fields of grain nor anything to make it look like farming i think it is a stage station and the people who occupy do not expect to stay very long there are three other camps near the people of the other trains are having an emigrant ball or dance in a room they have hired they sent a committee with a polite invitation to our camp for us to join them which was as politely declined they are strangers and the conduct of some of the women is not ladylike to say the least we meet a friend tuesday may thirtieth we girls were riding in advance of the wagons when we saw a long freight train coming 
we stopped to let our ponies graze until they would pass i glanced at the driver on the second wagon and recognized an acquaintance why girls that is kid short i exclaimed he looked at me so funny and began to scramble down from his high perch why miss sally i could not believe my eyes at first where did you drop from shaking hands with each of us didn't drop from anywhere have been thirty days getting here by the slow pace of an ox train sim buford and some more boys that you know are in the train you see coming he soon said good-bye to us spoke to a man on horseback who dismounted gave him his horse and climbed to the seat mr short had vacated in the front of the freight wagon drawn by eight mules while kid hurried off to see the boys he and sim have been neighbors schoolmates and intimate friends all their lives sim says kid is homesick and expects to go home as soon as he can after reaching omaha he has been freighting from omaha to kearney and has been away from home since last fall we are camping near another station with the same trains we camped near last night not far off wednesday may thirty first we are camping in the valley of the platte we are obliged to stop at the stage stations to get water for ourselves and the stock from the wells the water is very good clear and cold the same trains that have been camping near us since we left ashland are here again tonight two of the women called upon us a while ago we were not favorably impressed they are loud boisterous and unladylike they speak to strange gentlemen with all the familiarity of old acquaintances according to thackeray they are becky sharp kind of women thursday june first our little village on wheels has stopped near a large two-story log house that was built in the early fifties for a wayside tavern there are fifteen rooms there are frightful stories of dark deeds having been committed under that roof of unwary travelers homeward bound from california that never reached home but whether true or not i cannot say the people of the other trains are having a dance in the large dining room of the old house friday june second as ezra and i were riding in front of the train we came to where a man was sitting on the ground hugging his knees two men were standing near trying to talk to him seemingly as we rode up one of them came toward us saying that is an indian over there we rode close to him and ezra said how but he did not even grunt he was very disappointing as the noble red man we read about he wore an old ragged federal suit cap and all there were no feathers beads nor blankets he was not black like a negro more of a brown and a different shade from the mulatto he was ugly as sin on the banks of the platte saturday june third here we are on the platte with about two hundred wagons in sight we are now on what is known as the plains my idea of the plains has been very erroneous for i thought they were one continuous level or plain as far as the eye could reach no hills nor hollows but it is nothing else than the platte river valley with high bluffs on either side there is some timber on the banks but the timber of any consequence is on the islands in the middle of the river out of reach of the axe of the emigrant this is the junction of the roads from st joe and plattsmouth and that is why there are so many wagons here tonight surely among all these people there must be a minister of the gospel so perhaps we will have public worship tomorrow our trip grows more interesting even mrs kerfoot seems interested as so many people are going west it must be the thing to do end of section four
Section 5 of Days on the Road, Crossing the Plains in 1865 by Sarah Raymond Herndon. Sunday, June 4th. We are organized into a company of 45 wagons. A captain and orderly sergeant have been elected, and hereafter we will travel by a system. Mr. Hardenbrook is our captain. He has gone on this trip before. He is taking his wife and little girl with him to Montana. A Mr. Davis is our orderly sergeant. We are now coming into a country infested with Indians, so it is required by government officials that all emigrants must organize into companies of from 40 to 60 wagons, elect captains, and try to camp near each other for mutual protection. The grass for stock is unlimited. About 20 of the wagons in our train are freight wagons, belonging to the Walker brothers, Joe and Milt. Joe has his wife with him. Milt is a bachelor. Their sister, Miss Lighty, and a younger brother, D, are with them. They are going to Montana. We have been introduced to Mr. and Mrs. Hardenbrook and to the Walkers and their ladies. They are pleasant, intelligent people and will add much to the pleasure of our party, no doubt. Frank and I went horseback riding this afternoon to the station to get some good water from the well. I cannot drink the river water. No public worship today, although there were so many of us here. Monday, June 5th. We were awakened at an early hour this morning with a bugle call. Three companies were organized yesterday, there were about 20 wagons that were not asked to join either party, so they pulled up stakes and left while Frank and I were away. The strange women were of the party. They must be some miles ahead by this time, and I hope they will stay ahead. When our long train of wagons are stretched out upon the road, we make a formidable-looking outfit for the Indians to attack as far as the eye can reach before us and behind us there are wagons 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 some drawn by oxen some by mules and some by horses all fall into the slow sure gait of the oxen there are whole freight trains drawn by oxen there are more ox teams than all others after our evening meal a number of us started for a stroll along the bank of the river. Before we reached the river, we were met by a perfect cloud of mosquitoes that literally drove us back. I never came so near being eaten up. There is a strong breeze blowing toward the river, which keeps them from invading the camps, for which I am thankful. Otherwise, there would be little rest or sleep for us tonight. They are the first mosquitoes we have seen on the road. Tuesday, June 6th. It is sweet to be awakened with music, if it is only a bugle. Our bugle certainly makes sweet music. The road is becoming very dry and dusty, which makes riding in the wagon rather disagreeable sometimes. Mother and I take turns driving the horses and riding Dick, rather the most of the time i ride dick one of our boys goes out with the herders at night so one of them is generally sleepy and sleeps during the day while the other drives the ox team the order of our going wednesday june seventh there is such a sameness in our surroundings that we seem to be stopping in the same place every night with the same neighbors in front and back of us and across the corral when we organized mr kerfoot's wagons were driven just in front of ours and mr morrison's just behind ours so we have the same next door neighbors only they have changed places we are in the central part of the left hand side of the corral the wagons occupied by the walkers and hardenbrooks are just opposite in the right-hand side of the corral. We always stop in just this way, if only for an hour at noon, which we do every day for lunch, 
and to water the stock when we halted today the rain began to pour the stock scattered in every direction when it stopped raining the cattle could not all be found in time to start again this afternoon so we only made half a day's drive it has commenced raining again and promises a rainy night it is not very pleasant camping when it rains yet it would be much more unpleasant if it did not rain to lay the dust refresh the atmosphere and make the grass grow when the captain finds a place for the corral he rides out where all can see him and gives the signal the first and central wagons leave the road the first to drive to where the captain stands the other and all behind it cross over a sufficient distance to form the corral by the wagon stopping so as to form a gateway for the stock to pass through turned so that they will not interfere with each other when hitching the next wagon drives to position with the right hand side of cover almost touching the left hand or back outer edge of the wagon in front with tongues of wagons turned out so that all can be hitched to at one time in this way the entire corral is formed meeting at the back an oblong circle forming a wall or barrier the cattle cannot break through the horses are caught and harnessed outside the corral but the cattle have to be driven inside to be yoked thursday june eighth it rained all night seemingly without cessation the wind did not blow so there was no harm but lots of good done i am glad when the rain comes in the night time instead of daytime where the beds touched the covers they were quite wet this morning friday june ninth we came through a little town valley city there is a very pretty attractive looking house near the road cash and i had come on ahead of wagons our inclination to enter that pretty home was irresistible so we dismounted took off our habits hitched our ponies and knocked at the door a very pleasant lady opened the door and gave us hearty welcome we told her frankly why we came she laughed and said i have had callers before with the same excuse but you need not apologize i am glad my home is attractive to strangers the gentleman of the house is postmaster and has his office in the room across the hall from the parlor while we were there the coach arrived and the mail was brought in he did not know we were there and called to his wife to come see this mail we went with her and oh such a mess they had emptied the mail sack on some papers that had been spread upon the floor and such a lot of dilapidated letters and papers i never saw before i picked up a photograph of an elderly lady but we could not find the envelope from which it had escaped perhaps some anxious son away out in the mines far from home and friends and mother will look in vain for mother's pictured face and be so sadly disappointed i am so sorry for the boy that will miss getting his mother's photograph she looks like such a sweet motherly mother a great many of the letters were past saving if the owners had been there they could not have deciphered either address or the written contents for they were only a mass of pulp the postmaster said it was because they send such old leaky mailbags on this route those post office folks seem to think any old thing will do for the west when we ought to have the very best and strongest because of the long distances they must be carried all that could be were carefully handled and spread out to dry still they would reach their destination in a very dilapidated condition we have made a long drive are within four miles of fort kearney there are a great many wagons within sight besides our own long train whichever way we look we can see wagons 
the road from kansas city comes into this road not far from valley city and there are as many or more coming that way as the way we came people leaving war-stricken missouri no doubt i have never seen a fort i do hope kearney will come up to my expectations fort kearney saturday june tenth i was disappointed in fort kearney as i so often am in things i have formed an idea about there are very comfortable quarters for the soldiers they have set out trees and made it quite a pretty place away out here in the wilderness but there is no stockade or place of defense with mounted cannon as i had expected sim and i rode horseback through the fort while the wagons kept the road half a mile north of the fort only a few of us came by way of the fort a soldier gave us a drink of water from a well by the wayside he seemed a perfect gentleman but had such a sad expression we were told that these soldiers were in the confederate service were taken prisoners confined at rock island and enlisted in the government service to come out here and fight indians they are from georgia and alabama two families have joined our train and come into corral on the opposite side just behind the walkers mr and mrs kennedy a newly married couple and mr and mrs bower with a daughter fourteen and son five we only came one and a half miles west of the fort near kearney city i do not understand why we have made such a short drive for the boys say the feed is not good it has been eaten off so close sunday june eleventh we were obliged to leave camp and travel today the first sunday we have hitched up since we started it was a case of necessity as there was not feed for our large herds of cattle and horses we made only a short drive just to get good feed for the stock we are camping near a station that must seem like a military post there are so many soldiers several soldiers came to our camp this afternoon they confirmed what we heard yesterday they are confederate soldiers they were prisoners and their homes are in far away georgia and alabama and they are desperately homesick it is a distressing sickness i have been so homesick that i could not eat or sleep and a cure was not effected until i was at home again then how nice it did seem to be home and how good everything tasted i do hope this cruel homicidal war will soon be over and these fine-looking southern gentlemen will be permitted to go to their homes and loved ones who no doubt are waiting and longing for their return my heart aches for them eleven graves monday june twelfth we stood by the graves of eleven men that were killed last august by the indians there was a sort of bulletin board about midway and at the foot of the graves stating the circumstances of the frightful tragedy they were a party of fourteen twelve men and two women wives of two of the men they were camped on plum creek a short distance from where the graves are they were all at breakfast except one man who had gone to the creek for water he hid in the brush or there would have been none to tell the tale of the massacre there had been no depredations committed on this road all summer and emigrants had become careless and traveled in small parties they did not suspect that an indian was near until they were surrounded and the slaughter had commenced all the men were killed and scalped and the women taken prisoners they took what they wanted of the provisions burned the wagons and ran off with the horses the one man that escaped went with all haste to the nearest station for help the soldiers pursued the indians had a fight with them and rescued the women one of them had seen her husband killed and scalped 
and was insane when rescued and died at the station the other woman was the wife of the man that escaped they were from st joe missouri ezra had quite an accident today he went to sleep while driving the family wagon he was on guard last night the horses brought the wheel against a telegraph pole with a sudden jerk that threw him out of his seat and down at the horse's heels a sudden awakening with a badly bruised ankle we are in the worst place for indians on all this road the bluffs come within half a mile on our left and hundreds of savages could hide in the hollows the underbrush and willows are dense along the river banks there is an island about a mile in length that comes so near this side in many places that a man could leap from bank to bank the island is a thick wood a place where any number of the dreaded savages could hide and shoot down the unwary traveler with the guns and ammunition furnished them by the united states government how i would like to climb to the top of those bluffs and see what is on the other side but the captain says stay within sight of camp and i must obey a narrow escape tuesday june thirteenth cash neely and i created quite a sensation this morning we waited after the train had started to mount our ponies as we usually do cash and i had mounted but neely led her pony and we went down to the river to water them neely found some beautiful wild flowers and she insisted upon gathering them of course we waited for her the train was winding round a bend in the road and the last wagons would soon be out of sight we insisted that she must come the train will be out of sight in five minutes and we may be cut off by savages in ambush she did not scare worth a cent she led her pony into a little hollow to mount when we saw two men coming toward us as fast as they could ride cash rode at an easy canter to meet them while i waited for neelie who was deliberately arranging her flowers so that she would not crush them those men are coming after us perhaps there are indians around she took her time just the same when the captain saw that the train would soon be out of sight he went to mr morrison who was on horseback and said ride quietly back and warn those girls of their danger there are indians around they have been seen by the guard on the island and by the herders in the hollows of the bluffs this morning they would not be safe one minute after the train is out of sight they had kept it quiet as they did not wish to cause unnecessary alarm for they knew there was no danger for the indians knew they were being watched and besides we were too many for them mr morrison started but not quietly he snatched off his hat whipping his horse with it passed mr kerfoot's wagon as fast as his horse could go mr kerfoot asked what is the matter and someone said indians he wound the lines round the brake handle leaped from his high seat on the front of the wagon grabbed the first horse in reach snatched mr gatewood's boy out of the saddle jumped on the horse and came tearing toward us lashing the horse with his long whip his hat flew off soon after he started but he did not know it he passed mr morrison and meeting cash he stopped long enough to bring his whip over her horse's haunches with all his might and sent her flying toward the train he next met me for i started when i saw them coming and was perhaps a hundred yards ahead of neely and stopped and said miss sally do you know that we are in the very worst indian country there is on this road he did not wait for a reply but went on to neely who was looking all about to see the indians he gave her pony a cut with his whip as he had caches and we went flying over the ground neelie's merry laughter pealing forth mr kerfoot did not speak to either of us 
mr morrison had turned back with cash and scolded all the way she said he stuttered and stuttered until she had hard work to keep from laughing the captain had stopped the train and we were greeted with loud cheering and hurrahs there was considerable joking about our being anxious for an adventure and the young men were profuse in their declarations about what they would have done if we had been captured by the indians everyone laughed about our narrow escape as they called it except mr kerfoot he was pale and trembling it is a shame that he should have been so unnecessarily frightened by our thoughtlessness and i believe he thinks it was my fault i wonder what he would have thought if i had left neely to come alone end of section five section six of days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain wednesday june fourteenth one of the men found the skull of a human being today while we were stopping at noon it seems horrible to think of one's bones being scattered about in such a manner there is a storm coming a storm on the plains is something to be dreaded especially a windstorm old men who have been freighting across the plains for years say they have seen wagons upset with three tons of freight in a windstorm i am more afraid of a windstorm than of indians the boys say i am not afraid of indians at all thursday june fifteenth the storm came with great violence last evening we saw it coming in time to be prepared for it so there was no damage done the rain came down in torrents and made the roads as hard and smooth as a floor not any mud it has been fine for horseback riding everything seems so fresh and clean and pure and not too warm mr milt walker joined us about an hour before camping time he seems a very pleasant gentleman friday june sixteenth we had a storm last night much more terrific than the night of the fourteenth yet there was no harm done more than to frighten some of the women and children for my part i enjoyed the coming of the storm exceedingly i never witnessed a storm scene so sublimely grand oh for the pen of an artist that i might picture the majesty and grandeur of the coming of that storm bows nellie bower has a pony and rides with us sometimes she is a very mature young lady for her age and very pleasant company neelie and i were riding together this morning while cash and nellie bower rode a short distance ahead we had been on the road about half an hour when dr fletcher and milt walker rode up requesting the pleasure of our company in a very formal manner of course we smilingly bowed assent and the doctor rode with neelie and milt with me it is the first time there has been any formality in our pairing off while riding the boys sometimes ride with us but they come informally and we ride as we please and stop and climb into the wagon when we please without saying by your leave i am sorry any such formality has been commenced for when i want to lope off and be by myself i want to feel free to do so rather than to be constrained to entertain a bow as we did this morning of course dr fletcher and mr walker have not gone with us thus informally i presume we succeeded in entertaining them for when the train turned out for noon each gentleman looked at his watch and wondered if it could be possible it is noon dr fletcher is stepbrother of the walkers his mother and their father being married he is physician for our train an intelligent handsome man below medium in size 
i think he must be dyspeptic for he is always finding fault with everything he seems to admire neely very much we came through cottonwood this morning stopped at noon where the feed is fine so it has been decided that we will stay here until tomorrow the sky has the appearance of another storm this evening we have had a busy afternoon saturday june seventeenth there was a brisk shower last evening about dark only lasted about half an hour there was no wind about midnight the cattle stampeded the herders do not know what frightened them but the first thing thought of was indians yet there were none visible some of the cattle were not found until this afternoon so here we will have to stay another night the bluffs near here are quite high and abrupt i climbed to the top this morning i seemed to be away up yonder when looking down at our corral the people looked like midgets the bluffs are one hundred and fifty feet high i received a beautiful bouquet of wild flowers this evening but do not know who sent it the boy said a gentleman sent it but he either could not or would not tell what gentleman perhaps the one that sent it thought i would know instinctively but i am certainly in the dark two gentlemen took lunch at our table this afternoon they are father and son hillhouse met them out on the road they asked him do you know where we can get something to eat we have had nothing since a very early breakfast he brought them to our wagons and we soon had a lunch ready for them their name is reed the father's hair and whiskers are as white as snow otherwise he is not an aged looking man they asked questions and when they found we had not fully decided upon our destination they insisted that montana is the place for us they have been there and are going again with freight they belong to the irvine train each train goes by the name of its captain ours is known as the hardenbrook train then there is the mcmahon train and the dickerson train that always camp within sight of us for mutual protection we have not met any of the people from the other trains the irvine train which is very large are some miles ahead of us the reeds were hunting cattle had been as far back as cottonwood but without success the son had a long talk with the boys before leaving camp after he had gone hillhouse came around and took a seat on the wagon tongue near where i was engaged in the interesting occupation of the week's mending i said mr reed thinks montana the place for us we decide to go to montana yes so do the walkers and mr hardenbrook and mr morrison and everyone else that are going to montana well why not go there i do not like for you and mother to go there for it will be rough living i expect but i intend to go as soon as you are settled somewhere near mr kerfoot's folks just listen to the boy mother come here for five minutes do what do you think this boy is saying that he is going to montana when we are settled in california or some other place well if he is going to montana we are going too how many women are on their way there in these trains i reckon it will not be any worse for us than it will be for them all right if you are both willing to go to montana we will change our plans accordingly it is not as far as california and i know he is glad so it was settled then and there that montana will be our destination sunday june eighteenth we started very early this morning as soon as light about four o'clock i think the most of the women were yet in bed it was a glorious morning and i did so enjoy my early ride on dick we had not been on the road very long when frank joined me i told him we had decided to go to montana 
he was silent a moment then said it is the place to go i do hope we can persuade uncle ezra to go there too i hope he will decide to go with us for it would be hard to part with all of you now it would seem almost like leaving home again we halted at nine o'clock had breakfast at ten started again at twelve stopped again at four and are camping on fremont's slough monday june nineteenth we passed two graves this morning that had been made within a month the first a man who shot himself accidentally three weeks ago the other a woman forty years old who died one month ago today as i stood beside the lonely graves i thought of the tears that had been shed the prayers that had been uttered the desolation of heart that had been endured by those who had been obliged to go on and leave their loved ones here in the wilderness how my heart ached for them my heart went out in thanksgiving and praise to our heavenly father that there had been no serious sickness in these trains with so many people it is marvelous we are camped on the banks of the south platte the men have driven the stock across to an island i do not know if it is because they are afraid of the indians stampeding them or that the grass is better if there should be danger i presume they would not tell us there is a town of prairie dogs near several of us went to make them a visit but the boys had been there with their guns shooting at the little things and frightened them so they would not come out although we waited in silence almost until dark i shall make another effort to see them very early in the morning before the boys are awake i have heard they are early risers that they come out to greet the rising sun we met an acquaintance today will musgrove he is on his way to central city colorado he is night herder for a freight train the most casual acquaintance seems like an especial friend when we meet away out here so far from home or anywhere else prairie dogs tuesday june twentieth winthrop was quite sick last night with cramp colic i was up with him the latter part of the night so was dressed and ready for my visit to prairie dog town at an early hour the little fellows were up standing at their doors and greeted me with a welcoming bark some of them turned and darted away no doubt to tell others we had come for they immediately came back to peep out at us and bark and chatter as if carrying on a lively discussion they seemed perfectly fearless as long as we kept our distance but if we tried to get a nearer view they whisked away and were gone in an instant then they would send out two or three scouts and if we had gone far enough away they would come again to their doors they have been well described by many writers cash and frank joined me while at prairie dog town i rode horseback this morning and milt walker rode with me winthrop is about well this evening his was the first sickness we have had will musgrove came up with us while we were halted for noon his train is a short distance behind he rode with me in the wagon all afternoon and drove the horses and mother rode dick we had a long talk about friends at home he took dinner with us and then said good-bye and we will see him no more for we will travel faster than the freight train wednesday june twenty first mr and mrs morrison are large-hearted cheerful people who seem to be always happy and trying to make others happy mrs morrison learned that miss lighty walker has her guitar and sings beautifully so she invited her to come to their tent and helped to entertain a few friends it was a very pleasant diversion while lighty was singing the men and boys from all over the corral came near to listen when she sang the cottage by the sea 
both inside and outside the tent there was great applause that terminated in an encore but no she would not sing any more she murmured something about the rabble and laid her guitar away if i was gifted with a talent with which i could give pleasure to people i would certainly do so whenever opportunity was afforded i would be glad to promote the happiness and dispel as much sorrow as possible in this sorrowful world thursday june twenty second we came through a place called star ranch or old california crossing we are camped twelve miles below julesburg mr reed called this evening we told him we had decided to go to montana he seemed as pleased as though personally interested says the irvine train is only half a mile ahead tonight and invited us to go with him to call upon the young ladies we with one accord asked to be excused we all felt that we are not in calling costume friday june twenty third we are camping in colorado came through julesburg a rather insignificant looking place to have such notoriety as it has in the newspapers we met a company of soldiers with about twenty indian prisoners they were captured at fort laramie and they are taking them to fort kearney the soldiers had a fight with about one thousand indians three weeks ago there were no soldiers killed though a number were seriously wounded and they lost a good many horses there are squaws and papooses with the prisoners though not captives the indians in the fight were sioux and cheyenne they all look alike to me they were the most wretched looking human creatures i ever saw nothing majestic dignified or noble looking about any of the indians i have seen an ex-confederate soldier gave me my information about the fight there are a great many southern soldiers on this route we passed another newly made grave this afternoon mr reed called this evening saturday june twenty fourth i was caught in a hailstorm this morning i was half a mile from the wagons on a high bluff looking over the river watching the storm coming i did not realize that it was so near but all at once it came down pell-mell and gave me some pretty hard knocks dick seemed in a hurry to get to the train and i let him go we seemed to fly over the ground through the storm but we had the benefit of it all for it stopped just when we reached the wagons i unsaddled dick and turned him out while i took passage in the wagon changed my wet clothes for dry ones and wrapped in a shawl to keep from taking cold when the teams were being hitched up at noon hillhouse said to me dick has not had water you would better ride to the river and give him a drink the river was half a mile from the road but in sight all the way dick cantered to the watering place drank all he wanted and we started back when i saw someone coming toward me i will not say who it was because of what followed i thought you were getting too far behind for safety oh there isn't any danger you need not bother about me bother oh no and then came a declaration that about took my breath at first i felt that i would like to box the presumptuous boy's ears then i wanted so much to laugh but when i saw how desperately in earnest he was i thought perhaps i have been to blame for not seeing how things were tending i was perfectly amazed such a thought never occurred to me our ride back to the train was rather embarrassing to me i tried to make him see the comicality of the whole business but he would not see it we passed a station where the indians had burned all that would burn but these adobe dirt roofed houses or cabins rather would not make much of a blaze i imagine 
inside one of the cabins or what was left of it were two dead indians that had been killed in the fray sunday june twenty fifth mr reed came with six young ladies to call upon us this morning also one gentleman from the irvine train they had gone down into their trunks and were dressed in civilization costumes they were mrs nanny and maggie irvine sisters their brother tom irvine miss molly irvine a cousin miss forbes and two other young ladies whose names i have forgotten they are all very pleasant intelligent young people the trains are keeping as close together as possible for protection for the indians are on the warpath every station and ranch building that we are passing these days have been destroyed preaching services we have had a preaching service this afternoon reverend mr austin of the methodist episcopal church south the church that i am a member of was the preacher the services were well attended and the sermon was fine he compared our situation with that of the children of israel in the wilderness he spoke of god's care for them and that he careth for us spoke in an earnest manner of our dependence upon god and our inability to take care of ourselves or to accomplish anything without god's help and cooperation and of the necessity of earnest prayer and faith in all circumstances of life and always to remember that the everlasting arms are underneath when the people were gathered at the call of the bugle some sat on chairs in the shade of wagons some under umbrellas some in carriages and light wagons mother and i stood near a carriage before the service commenced when a lady invited us to sit with her and her children a little boy of five and a girl of three we accepted and were introduced to mrs yeager wife of the physician for the chillicothe train mr dickerson captain the services were held at their camp mrs yeager is a southern methodist too rev austin is a member of the chillicothe train i am glad there is at least one preacher among us music in camp monday june twenty sixth mr and mrs may a newly married couple that came into our train at the junction of the roads are both musicians several of our young men have fine voices and with lydie's guitar and mr may's violin we have had an enjoyable musical away out here in the wilderness if the indians had been within listening distance it would be interesting to know what impression the music made upon their minds as music hath charms etc the music this evening has been the happiest feature of the day for i have had to ride in the wagon all day one of the big horses went lame this morning so dick was put in harness and the dear little fellow has worked all day he looks funny besides the big horse the harness had to be taken up to the last holes to make it fit him i would not enjoy taking this trip without a saddle horse or pony to ride i must be more generous hereafter and let lyde and mrs kennedy and other ladies that have no horse ride dick oftener than i have been doing i have not fully realized how very tiresome it is to ride in the wagon all day and day after day end of section six section seven of days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain i have always supposed that good water would be very scarce on this road we have not found it so there are always from one to three wells at the stage stations with excellent water free for all 
thanks to uncle sam for this provision for our welfare in some places wood is very scarce and must be hauled from long distances we cooked dinner this evening with wood hauled from near cottonwood cedar logs are fastened under the wagons lengthwise between the wheels as there are no stumps or rocks in the road they carry all right when there is no wood to pick up the log is taken down a piece cut off and split up for use it is surprising with what a little bit of wood one can cook a meal on these sheet iron stoves tuesday june twenty seventh among the men who are driving for the walkers is an eccentric old bachelor named foggy he is very bashful when in the presence of ladies i have often heard it said that men cannot drive oxen without swearing it is a mistake i have seen a whole lot of ox driving on this trip and today i heard the first profane oath since we left the missouri river it would have been funny if it had not been shocking we have traveled all day where the bluffs come close to the river the road is very uneven little hills and hollows in some of the hollows there is mud mr foggy admires neely very much at a distance of course we often hear the extravagant compliments he pays her and his regrets about that troublesome if soon after start this morning neely and i rode to the front to escape the dust and sand that were flying as we came near the front wagon we were startled by hearing a terrific oath the wagon had stuck in the mud and would of course stop the entire train mr foggy was the driver he was greatly embarrassed and distressed when he knew we had heard him swear and stop stock still and let the wheels sink into the mud so that they had to double teams to get them out he afterward told some of the boys he was effectually cured of swearing that he never felt so cheap in his life and if he is ever tempted to swear he knows the remembrance of that moment will check him we had a refreshing shower about two o'clock that laid the dust cooled the air and made everything sweet and fresh we hoped and expected to have a pleasant afternoon after the rain there was a calm not a little tiny breeze or breath of air it was just suffocating and then came a cloud of buffalo gnats that almost devoured us so that horseback riding was an impossibility wednesday june twenty eighth cash is on the sick list today i trust it will not prove to be anything serious i greatly fear mr kerfoot's family are destined to have considerable sickness before this trip is ended they have such a sameness of diet and it is so poorly cooked i fear the result when we started on this trip not one member of the family had ever prepared an entire meal they had always had a houseful of servants to cook and do everything else for them the first two or three weeks neely and her mother tried to learn to cook and mother and i tried to teach them it takes great patience to learn to bake in stoves out of doors they heat red hot so quickly and cool just as suddenly they must have careful attention all the time they made several failures baking light bread and giving it up in disgust settled down to biscuit that are hard as brickbats when cold bacon coffee and beans when we stop long enough to cook them they were well supplied with fruit at first their canned fruit was so easily served that it is all gone they have dried fruit but think it too much trouble to cook neely does the cooking with some assistance from her father such as getting wood making fires bringing water grinding the coffee etc henrietta and emma 
the next younger sisters wash the dishes it is no small undertaking to cook for a family of twelve i do not blame neelie for getting tired she says they have such appetites it is not worth while to tempt them with extras neelie is the dearest sweetest most unselfish daughter and sister it seems they all depend upon her the children go to her in their troubles and perplexities her father and mother rely upon her and she is always ready to do what she can for any and everybody that needs her help she is unselfishness personified the wind blew so all afternoon that we could not ride horseback the roads are smooth and hard as asphalt result of rain yesterday and the wind today dr fletcher who was called to prescribe for cash says she will be all right in a day or two the mountains in sight thursday june twenty ninth we could see the mountains as the sun was sinking behind them they were plainly visible though one hundred miles away it does not seem possible they are so far away long's peak and others near it are the points in sight they look very much as i have imagined mountains would appear in the distance mr walker is my informant as to names of places distances etc he has been over the road and seems to know all about it we usually ride some hours in company each day so i have a fine opportunity for asking questions and he seems a willing instructor he never broaches the sentimental has never paid me a compliment in words i am glad to say for since my late experience i would hesitate to ride with him were he not the sensible man that he is we crossed a small stream today that was bridged and had to pay fifty cents toll for each wagon the ford had been spoiled or we could have crossed without the bridge friday june thirtieth we stopped at noon where the road forks the left-hand road goes to denver mr and mrs may and mr and mrs kirkland and children took the left-hand road as they are going to denver mr may's brother george goes on to montana on horseback he will leave us in the morning and depend upon reaching stations or emigrant camps for food and shelter nights i do hope the indians will not get his scalp we have been feasting on antelope the first that any of our party have killed it is fine much better than venison but then i never ate venison when i was so hungry for fresh meat we do get so tired of cured meat we see no game except antelope and jackrabbits the great herds of buffalo that we read about have not been in sight as yet mr morrison's four-horse team ran away this afternoon with mrs morrison and the children in the wagon i had been riding with them since noon had just left the wagon when all the horse teams were driven out of ranks and down to the river for water the lead horses took fright at an ant hill the ant hills are as big as a chicken house and started to run there were several men near who caught and stopped them just as the four-wheel went over the bank of the river mr harding was driving he tried to rein them away from the river but they were right on the verge when stopped one moment more and there would have been a serious accident mrs morrison did not scream nor try to jump out neither did she allow the children to but sat quite still and acted like the sensible woman that she is we are only six miles below the crossing of the south platte saturday july first we were awakened this morning at the first peep of dawn by the sound of the bugle call soon the teams were hitched corral broken and we were journeying to the crossing of the river 
where we were driven into corral again while we were getting breakfast the men were raising the wagon beds and fixing them upon blocks as high as the wheels and binding them tightly with ropes to the coupling poles and lower parts of the wagons ready to ford the river they had a top-heavy appearance as if the least jolt would topple them over some of the women were very nervous about riding in wagons set up on stilts and felt quite certain somebody would be drowned wagons were crossing when we drove into corral of course we had to wait our turn first come first served some enterprising young men have the blocks and ropes there to rent at a very reasonable hire too for they might have asked what they would we had no choice but to use them the river is half a mile or more wide about halfway over there is a large freight wagon stuck in the quicksand just below the track of the wagons it has been there since yesterday it is slowly slowly sinking and cannot be gotten out it has been unloaded and left to its fate it seems a signal of distress to warn drivers to keep further up the river and avoid the quicksands i drove the horse team over and hillhouse rode dick and directed our going the wagons of our train were all over and in corral by two o'clock without accident or mishap wagons have been crossing all day and this evening we are a considerable town of tents and wagons more than two hundred wagons within sight on the north side of the south platte at the eastern extremity of fremont's orchard though why it is called an orchard i cannot understand for there is certainly no fruit neither promise of fruit about it mostly quaking asp and cottonwood i think our corral is just to the left of where the wagons drive out and near the bank of the river hillhouse has crossed the river on dick at least twenty times today he seemed to know just how to help and has been in constant demand so he and dick are thoroughly tired out tonight we will stay here over sunday and hope to have religious services tomorrow as there are several preachers with us i have not met any of them except brother austin who preached for us last sunday cash is much better able to be out though quite pale and weak the mountains looming up in the distance seem to be the goal to which we are tending and now we seem to make some progress every day for we are certainly nearer than when we first saw them on the twenty ninth of june before they came in sight we did not seem to make any progress but traveled day after day and seemed to camp at night always in the same place there was such a sameness in the landscape in the early morning when the sun shines upon the snow-capped mountains the effect is thrilling they seem to be the great altars of earth raised up to heaven for the morning sacrifice a town of tents and wagons sunday july second it is wonderful wonderful to behold how this town of tents and wagons has sprung up since yesterday morning when there was no sign of life on this north bank of the south platte and now there are more than one thousand men women and children and i cannot guess how many wagons and tents the wagons have been crossing all day the last one has just been driven into corral at sunset i was sitting on the bank of the river watching with anxiety the wagons as they ploughed through the deep waters for the ford has washed out and the wagons go in much deeper than when we crossed yesterday when a gentleman came and introduced himself as dr howard physician for the mcmahon train he said miss raymond i have known you by sight since we camped at kearney and now as i have an errand for an excuse 
i hope to become better acquainted i could not imagine what his errand could be for he talked of other matters for fifteen minutes or more then said miss raymond i have been directed to your wagons for the best and most wholesome bread that is baked on this road captain mcmahon's nephew robert sutherland has been very sick but is now convalescing and needs nutritious and wholesome food to help him gain strength i came to ask you for a piece of good bread of course i gave him a loaf and said come get more when that is gone he thanked me profusely there has been no serious accident nor any lives lost although thousands of cattle hundreds of horses and more than a thousand human beings have crossed the river since yesterday morning oh for the pen of a dickens to describe this wonderful scene which no one ever has or ever will see again just as it is the moon is at the full and shining brightly as there is not a cloud in the sky the campfires do not glow as they do dark nights the men are building a great bonfire in the middle of our extemporaneous town we worship in the wilderness there is to be a praise and thanksgiving service for our safe conduct through the deep waters and our protection from the indians the people are beginning to gather near the bonfire and i must go too later our service is over it was grand the singing of the old familiar hymns by so many voices spontaneously was inspiring the talks by five or six ministers of different denominations were full of love for the master and brotherly love for everyone an invitation was then given for all who had enlisted in the service of the master to come forward and shake hands with the preachers thus testifying for christ neelie was the first one in that long procession to give her hand precious girl she is always first in every good work i noticed dr howard in line and i also noticed that mr reed and milt walker were not among the soldiers of the cross the feed for stock is abundant if it were not so all these cattle and horses could not find pasture monday july third the scenes in this great expanse of low level land on the north side of the platte in the early hours of this morning is hard to describe corrals and camps here there and everywhere cattle and horses being driven into corrals to be harnessed and yoked men and women cooking by campfires and on stoves everybody seemed to be in a great hurry all was animation and life men riding after horses oxen and mules yelling hallooing and calling but not a profane oath did i hear among so many children we rarely ever heard a child cry and never hear a woman scold our train was the third to break camp and file into the road this morning the place that knew us yesterday will know us no more forever our town of tents and wagons that was teeming with life this morning is this evening deserted silent and uninhabited we have folded our tents and driven or rode away i did not mount immediately but led dick by the bridle and gathered a magnificent bouquet of the most beautiful wild flowers i had loitered by the way and did not notice that i was getting far behind our train when i looked up and saw only strangers in the train that was passing i thought it was time to mount threw the bridle over dick's head while arranging my flowers so that i would not crush them i saw a gentleman in the train throw down his whip and start toward me as if to assist me in mounting i waited until he was quite near then placing a hand on either horn 
i sprang lightly into the saddle turned and waved my bouquet toward him as dick galloped off such a cheer as the men in the train did raise and then such merry laughter it was fun to hear them dr howard says it was colonel woolfolk a gallant young widower and the men that witnessed it guyed him unmercifully for having been snubbed we came to the western extremity of fremont's orchard ten miles and stopped for lunch then came the sand hills where all the heaviest wagons had to double teams to get through the captain came on four miles and selected a camping ground and we drove to our places to wait for the heavy wagons to get through the sand hillhouse and several others who came on with us went hunting for antelope we have been feasting on antelope for several days it is fine but if i could have my choice i would rather live on ham and bacon all the while than to have our men go hunting in this indian country since we have crossed the platte we have no protection from the soldiers as there are no stations on this side of the river we suffer agony when our boys are away from camp guarding stock or hunting i have no fears for myself nor any of us while we are all together in corral but just a few away by themselves how easily they might be cut off there were indians seen this morning by men looking for feed for the stock it is almost dark and the boys have not come i think the captain is getting anxious he keeps looking in the direction the boys have gone 10 p m the boys have just come with one antelope they lost their bearings and came to the river one mile or more above camp and that was what kept them so late when we scolded they said they were obliged to stay to get at least one antelope for our fourth of july dinner tomorrow end of section seven section eight of days on the road crossing the plains in eighteen sixty five by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain we celebrate the fourth tuesday july fourth we made corral at eleven a m the captain announcing that we will stay four hours i do not know if we stopped so soon because it is the fourth or because it is so intensely warm and the sun beams so hot or because it was such a delightful camping place whatever the cause there we rested beneath the shade of large cottonwood trees and it was so pleasant we had dinner at two our bill of fare oyster soup roast antelope with oyster dressing cold beans warmed over dried fruit sauce and our last cake and custard for dessert we used the last of our eggs which were packed in salt it is surprising how nicely they have kept i believe they would have kept another month we had a very enjoyable feast with an abundance of lemonade without ice the boys put up a large swing on two large cottonwood trees two could swing at once with lots of strong arms to send us away up high we began to file into the road at three p m our fun was all too short dr fletcher rode with neely and milt walker with me wednesday july fifth here is where we would have crossed the south platte if we had not forded it at the east end of fremont's orchard on latham's ferry if all those wagons had crossed on the ferry it would have been a big pile of money for the ferrymen for they charge one dollar a team we passed a squalid looking indian village today it was just tepees and huts oh dear but they do look so uncomfortable we are at the mouth of the cache la poudre where somebody cached their powder 
the water is so very clear and cold it seems so nice after the muddy plat as there are no stations on the north side of the river there are no wells the cache poudre is supplied by springs that flow from the snow-capped mountains that seem to be right over there thursday july sixth as we were passing another indian town i peeped into two or three of their dwelling places they are desolate looking homes no sleeping places no tables chairs nor any furniture just some rolls of blankets and buffalo robes some camp kettles and that was all there were squaws and papooses innumerable squatted around on the outside of their tepees the squaws making moccasins or decorating them with beads when we said how they grinned and held up two fingers indicating they wanted two dollars for a pair we did not purchase the black hills friday july seventh we are camped at the foot of the black hills they seem like immense mountains to me there are four large corrals near the little village of la porte we rushed through with dinner then mrs hardenbrook and i started for the top taking our notebooks with us before we had gone far winthrop and frank joined us frank brought his gun i do not know if he expected to find indians or antelope up here after much puffing and blowing climbing and clambering we reached the top oh it is magnificently grand if only i could make a pen picture of this scene that others might realize it as i do the mount upon which we stand is shaped like the quarter of a ball or globe miles and miles in diameter and circumference we having climbed up the outside of the quarter to the top edge are looking down a steep precipice the perpendicular side of the quarter when a stone is thrown over it takes twenty-five seconds to reach the bottom where the cache la poudre river runs at the base of the precipice how easy to step off into eternity from this place i would not like to live near here lest i might be tempted to do it some time the valley over there looks as if away back in the ages past another quarter of the great ball that had been separated from this quarter had been lifted by giant hands and carried away leaving the most picturesque valley that i have ever beheld there are three prosperous looking farms in sight a large herd of cattle grazing and a beautiful grove or park at the northern end of the vale west of the valley and opposite where we stand are peaks much higher than this behind which the sun is sinking the setting sun has crowned the mountain tops with a crown of glory and brightness the moon is rising out of beautiful white fleecy clouds in the east it is lovely beyond description how beauteous is this earth how bright the sky how wisely planned by him who reigns on high the sun is gone night is coming we must go for we are at least one and a half miles from camp i fired frank's gun before starting i aimed at the river and hit the mark how weak and insignificant these words seem when compared with the reality we visit a beautiful spring saturday july eighth the scenic beauty of the route we have come over today was ever changing we were either coming through a narrow canyon across a beautiful vale climbing or descending a steep hill or mountain nellie bower and i had started on horseback to have the morning to ourselves when mr walker rode up and asked us to go with him to a lovely spring of delightfully cold clear water he knew of 
some two or three miles ahead we consented of course and had soon left the wagons behind us mr w has been over the road before and seems to know the landmarks and places of interest we found the spring as described in a beautiful dell where the loveliest wild flowers i ever saw are growing luxuriantly we were soon off our horses enjoying the cool delicious spring water we gave our horses a drink and then we each gathered a large bouquet of beautiful fragrant wild flowers they certainly are wasting their sweetness on the desert air i believe we were almost an hour ahead of the train mother scolded and so did mr bower because we had gone so far ahead of the wagons for it is said these hills are full of indians i am all the time forgetting about the indians mr kerfoot will not allow his girls to get out of sight i am glad mother is not so exacting as that but i ought not to impose upon her good nature and cause her to worry i never do intentionally but sometimes i forget we are camping in a beautiful basin surrounded on all sides by high hills and where the grass is plentiful there is only one other train with us but then it is the mcmahon train and they are all such fine-looking young men and of course they are brave that i always feel safe when they are near our captain has forbidden our going out of sight of camp there are canyons in all directions how i would like to explore hill house and sim buford gathered some wild currants while herding they will pass for fruit but they look better than they taste we have made sauce of them with lots of sugar and cream they look inviting and the boys seem to like them very few will satisfy me we can always have cream for breakfast as the milk stands overnight and a pat of the sweetest most delicious butter every evening when we travel as the milk is churned by the motion of the wagon fruit is very necessary on this trip because of the alkali in the water dust and air we breathe to keep us in health sunday july ninth i was up very early this morning i cannot spend precious time in bed after daylight while we are camping in this delightful place and have this perfect weather i led dick to the spring for a drink bathed my face and hands in the cool water picked a bouquet for the breakfast table and returned to camp to find the girls in bed they missed a glorious sight by not seeing the sun rise mother and mrs hardenbrook went with me to the top of the hill nearest camp this afternoon they picked flowers and enjoyed the view for a while then returned to camp leaving me to come later i sat on a large flat rock just below the top as mother said the indians could see me so much further if on the very top i promised her i would not go out of sight that if an indian carried me off they could see him and know where i had gone i did so enjoy the quiet of this sunday afternoon i had mrs prentice's delightful book stepping heavenward to read and time passed so quickly the sun was setting before i thought of going back to camp some of the boys laughed and said we were watching and if an indian had put in an appearance we'd have settled him we knew you would not see him until he had you i thanked them for their watchfulness we cut our names in stone monday july tenth just when we had mounted our ponies for our morning ride mr walker came and asked us to go with him to the top of a mountain we could see far ahead and to the right of the road he said the prospect is very fine indeed from that mountain top i was there two years ago cash and neely were included in the invitation also mary gatewood 
but their fathers would not let them go so nellie bower and i were the only ones who were allowed to accept his invitation we rode our ponies until the ascent became too steep and then dismounted and climbed it was a hard climb but we were amply paid the view was magnificently grand we found mr walker's name where he had cut it in the soft stone two years ago and we left our names with date and former place of residence cut in the stone there were hundreds of names there but i looked in vain for a familiar one i wonder if any one that we know will find ours we passed the graves of two men this morning who had been killed by the indians what a sad fate god forbid that any of our men or boys should die such a death we are camping near a military post virginia dale it is just as beautiful as the name would imply there are soldiers here for the protection of emigrants passing through these hills and mountains cash and i were riding with the captain when we came to the station the officer in charge came out to speak to the captain and asked some significant questions how long have you been in the hills two days and nights where have you camped in that basin about eighteen miles back we stayed over sunday have the indians troubled you we have seen no indians he seemed greatly surprised and said there has been no train come over that road within the last month without trouble especially where you stayed over sunday did you not notice those canyons in every direction the indians could surround you before you could know there was one near the hills are full of indians he told the captain where to camp and where to send the stock for safety and protection the captain thanked him and we were starting on when the mcmahon train came into sight aha he exclaimed i see now why you have not been molested just keep that train in sight and you need have no fear of indians and he just doubled up laughing until it was embarrassing to us but why why will that train be a protection more than another don't you see that portable engine lifted up there and all those iron pipes the indians think it is cannon or some sort of machinery invented for their destruction no doubt they believe it could kill them by the hundreds though the mountains stood between it and them so that is why we have not been molested we have heard of depredations before and behind us but we have not seen an indian blessings on the mcmahon train i hope we will not lose sight of it while we are in this indian country we have passed through some very narrow canyons today where there was barely room for one wagon to pass great rocks were hanging overhead on one side while a rushing stream beside and just below the road on the other there are beautiful waterfalls in the canyons i was standing watching one of the highest waiting for the wagons to pass the last one had gone when mr morrison came and peremptorily commanded me to come on miss sally the it, 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 in indians will c c carry you off some of these days he stuttered of course i went the captain's orders are do not leave camp this evening we were only just corralled when i saw lighty walker climbing a nearby mountain it is the first time i have known her to leave camp since we came into the black hills she is very much afraid of indians when she came back i asked why lydie did you not hear the captain's order that we were not to leave camp this evening oh there is no danger when the men are on guard and watching it is when they feel secure and are not looking out for them that i am afraid indians do not molest people when they are expecting them laramie plains tuesday july eleventh the sounding of the bugle 
and the echo that reverberated through the gorges this morning was enchantingly sweet and must have driven slumber from every eyelid we left the hills at noon and are camping on laramie plains we came over some very steep rocky roads before we reached the plains i watched the wagons anxiously as they descended the steep rocky mountainside bounding and bumping against the big rocks expecting and dreading an upset but all landed safely on level ground at last and i gave a sigh of relief and thanksgiving we have not had an uncomfortably warm night all summer but while we have been coming through the hills the nights have been really cold so that we have slept under blankets and comforts like winter time there is no sickness in camp at all it is marvelous how very well we are i hope it will continue so wednesday july twelfth we crossed the big laramie river just before noon had a good crossing the water is clear the bed of the river is covered with gravel the banks are low and the water is not very deep i rode across on dick the water just came to my stirrup we will stay here until tomorrow as there is no water for fifteen or twenty miles and we cannot go so far in half a day we young people planned a fishing expedition for this evening but the mosquitoes are so thick on the bank of the river we had to give it up some of the boys went seining brother winthrop was among them so we will have fish for breakfast tomorrow morning the mosquitoes have not disturbed our rest at night yet they have several times been very thick on the banks of the rivers but have not been troublesome in camp perhaps the smoke keeps them away the mcmahon train keeps with us so we are safe dr howard rode with us this morning he is a widower thursday july thirteenth we passed two large ponds of alkali this morning the water had dried up and the alkali was two or three inches thick all over the pond it looked like ice until we came very near mrs hardenbrook had a sick headache this afternoon i took care of little annie that she might not disturb her mother she is a dear sweet child and seems fond of me there was a rather serious accident as we were driving into corral mr hazelwood's horses were frightened and ran away upsetting the wagon and smashing it up considerably mrs hazelwood her sister and two children were in the wagon mrs h was considerably bruised the others were not hurt dick drank alkali water this evening i have been feeding him fat bacon no doubt the grease and alkali have turned to soap before now in his stomach and soap is not poison so he will not die this time and i will take better care of him the next time we are near alkali in the rain friday july fourteenth the men were until almost noon repairing the broken wagon an accident that happens to one is assumed by all until results are overcome as we were ready for the start a little girl ran among the oxen to catch her pet crow an ox kicked her on the forehead and cut a gash that had to have a few stitches and be bandaged so we were delayed again when order reigned once more we crossed the little laramie it is very much like the big laramie only not so wide nor deep i rode dick over and then came on ahead of the train keeping within sight when we had traveled about an hour the rain came down i was likely to get very wet before our wagons came for they were among the last in the train i took the saddle and bridle off dick sat down on the saddle to keep it dry and to wait for the wagon i was resigning myself to a drenching when mr grier driver of the front wagon came and spread a great 
big rubber coat over me so that i was completely sheltered and was hardly damp when our wagons came then mother drove the horses close up to the wagon in front i tossed my saddle and bridle in hopped up to the tongue of the wagon before the wagon behind got close up and we started without stopping but the one wagon we could not stop until we came to feed for stock so we were obliged to travel in the rain we drove into corral about four p m and are again quite near the mountains there are more pleasant things than camping in the rain the water is so impregnated with alkali i fear it will cause sickness the stock are in greater danger than we for we can guard against it end of section eight section nine of days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain saturday july fifteenth as i climbed out of the wagon this morning i saw the most beautiful rainbow i ever looked at the bow was complete the colors dazzlingly bright and just as vivid in the center as at the ends it was not raining in camp but raining hard on the mountainside the rainbow was so near we might easily have reached the end and found the pot of gold the rain came down all morning we did not break camp until ten o'clock and then made only a short drive we are camping among the hills once more with not another train in sight the mcmahon train is behind us but we do not know how far away they are so we are glad to wait until they catch up there is a mountain near that i would like to climb but it is against orders sunday july sixteenth we are all here although some of the women last night seemed to think there was small chance of our seeing the light of this morning's sun had we known that the mcmahon train was within calling distance just a hill intervening perhaps we would have rested easier and slept more soundly it is considered a very dangerous place where we were last night and where we have traveled today although it is sunday i am sure there is not one in camp that would have voted to stay there to rest we have heard horrible stories of the depredations that have been committed along this road and in these mountains within the last month we saw with our own eyes just before we came to rock creek a station that had been burned and all the inmates killed or taken prisoners there was none to tell the story of the fight although the bodies of all who were known to be there were not found the buildings were not all burned the fire either went out or was put out by the rain after the indians left they have been repaired and soldiers stationed there now we saw at the same station a coach that had been riddled with bullets it was found on the road about a mile from the station without horses driver or passengers indians it is supposed the indians killed the driver took the horses and it is not known yet whether there were passengers or not the coach being so riddled with bullets it is feared there were passengers a guard of soldiers go with the coaches we meet or that pass us now we crossed rock creek on a toll bridge and had to pay fifty cents toll for each wagon just after we crossed the bridge and where there is a sudden turn in the road as it winds around the mountain we saw where two men had been killed and two wagons burned last week the tire became loose on a wheel of the next to the last wagon in a freight train the men stopped to tighten it while the rest of the train moved on not thinking of danger and was out of sight in a few minutes an hour later 
some of the men came back to see what kept them there they were dead and scalped the horses gone and wagons on fire the indians had taken all the freight they could use piled wood under the wagons and set it on fire we saw quantities of white beans scattered over the ground also the irons from the wagons we are within sight of elk mountain and seemingly quite near it sim and hillhouse picked a nice lot of gooseberries while stopping at noon i have been sitting in the wagon picking off stems all afternoon they also brought a bucket of snow it is really refreshing and such a novelty to have a snowball to eat in july the gooseberries are quite plentiful around here cash and i went with hillhouse and sim to pick some this evening but a shower drove us to camp the boys stayed and picked as long as they could see if we had time we could gather gooseberries enough to supply the train for a month they are very fine and large they are certainly an acceptable addition to our bill of fare where a sameness of diet is unavoidable i shall always consider them a fine fruit hereafter about an hour after we drove into corral the mcmahon train came and their corral is quite near we are so glad they are here we feel safe when they are near monday july seventeenth such a cold rainy dismal day as this has been it has rained without stopping from early morn until now and it is almost sundown this is the first all-day rain we have had this summer it has rained all night several times but that is not so bad since we have been in this indian country the tents have not been put up every one seems to think it safer in the wagons than in tents outside the corral so we have had to sit in the wagons all day i have read sewed written picked over gooseberries and ran through the rain and visited some yet the day has seemed long the herders have to take the stock two miles away to find feed so we are consumed with anxiety notwithstanding we know our father's care is round and about us and he can and will protect us when we came here we could see elk mountain but now it is enveloped in clouds entirely hidden from view it is not pleasant camping when it rains all day long tuesday july eighteenth the wagons started soon after daylight before we were out of bed we had been on the road a little while when i heard hillhouse call to brother winthrop who was driving our wagon oh just look winth isn't that a grand sight i knew there was something to see so i was soon up and dressed and sitting with winthrop i shivered with cold until my teeth chattered but was well repaid for any inconvenience by the grandeur of the sight i looked upon why try to describe or picture anything so entirely impossible the masses of fleecy white clouds with the brightness of the morning sun shining upon them as they floated around and over the top of the mountain made an ever-changing beauteous panorama that i cannot describe as the clouds rose higher and higher they seemed to mass over the top of the mountain as in benediction glittering in the sunshine until they seemed to melt away i waited until the sun had warmed the air then mounted dick for my morning ride the mcmahon train broke corral and drove into line just behind our wagons i had only just started when dr howard rode up on his pony joe and requested the pleasure of riding with me the doctor is a very pleasant cultured gentleman and is very fond of his pony yet joe cannot be compared with dick for beauty neither for easy gait 
why dick is the most beautiful pony on this road he is a bright bay with long and heavy black mane and tail and his gait is as easy as a cradle i can ride all day and not be tired at all while his horse well i will not describe him it might hurt the doctor's feelings we came to the foot of elk mountain on the medicine bow about nine o'clock we find plentiful and excellent feed for the stock so the captains have announced we will stay here until tomorrow we climb elk mountain the doctor thanked me for the pleasure our morning ride had afforded him and asked can we not make up a party to climb elk mountain after breakfast i hope so i will ask some of the young people about ten o'clock a few of us commenced the climb lighty walker nelly bower cash and neely sim buford brother hillhouse dr howard and myself we were well paid for the effort we found beautiful wild flowers and some wild strawberries not five feet from a snowbank the snow is in a ravine on the north side where the sun does not shine the berries and flowers are on the bank of the ravine high enough to catch the rays of the sun facing the south the view was fine we could see a large white lake far away in the west dr howard said it was alkali wednesday july nineteenth we passed the alkali lake this afternoon it was a strangely beautiful sight the water as white as milk the grass on the border intensely green i always thought grass would not grow where it is alkali but it is certainly growing there the contrast of white and green was vivid the wind was blowing the water into little glittering dancing skipping wavelets the sight was so unusual that it was fascinating though the water is so dreadfully poisonous there are several musicians in the mcmahon train lydy says they serenaded me last night she says they stood between our two wagons i think she is trying to tease me ask dr howard if you do not believe me he was one of them oh no i would be ashamed to acknowledge i did not hear them and would feel like a dunce if they had not been there dr howard gave me the bouquet he gathered on elk mountain which was most beautifully arranged and asked me to keep it until it falls to dust i have put it between the leaves of a book and will perhaps never think of it again we came through fort hallock today there were eight wigwams or teepees at the east end of the town the squaws wore calico dresses and hoops i believe they were more comical looking than in their blankets i fail as yet to recognize the noble red man they are anything else than dignified they seem lazy dirty obnoxious looking creatures cash and i made a few purchases at fort hallock i paid eighty cents for a choir of writing paper and cash paid fifty cents for a can of peaches mrs morrison is on the sick list today and delia kerfoot has a very sore mouth scurvy the doctor says caused by the alkali in the dust and air neely and frank are both complaining we cross the north platte thursday july twentieth the ground was covered with a white frost this morning and it is freezing cold mrs morrison and frank are better delia's mouth is healing neely continues to drag around she will not acknowledge that she is sick enough to go to bed but she certainly looks sick i wish they would call dr howard somehow i have more faith in him perhaps because he is older and more experienced we are on the banks of the north platte arrived about three o'clock did not stop for lunch at noon 
we came ahead of the other trains which will be here tonight we will have the privilege of crossing first in the morning the men have taken the herds five miles away to get good feed they are in danger from indians the captain called for volunteers my brothers both offered to go but the captain said only one of mrs raymond's boys must go hillhouse said he would be the one he was on guard last night too we are in no danger here for there are several trains here now and there will be more tonight oh the anxious watching the prayerful longing for day that we must endure this night because of loved ones exposed to danger what a precious privilege that we can go to the mercy seat with the assurance that if we ask aright our petitions will be granted how do people live without christ and a mercy seat what can they do when suffering anxiety grief or bereavement if they cannot go to jesus with their sorrows precious saviour what a refuge in time of trouble what a joy to carry everything to god in prayer the mcmahon train is near dr howard has been here he begged me to let him see my diary i asked to be excused friday july twenty first the night passed without alarm and we are all here i am thankful some of the men in our train were afraid to risk fording the river and paid four dollars per wagon to be ferried over on a rickety old ferry boat that looked more dangerous than driving over hillhouse and winthrop were both engaged with the ox team winthrop on the seat and hillhouse riding dick when they drove into the river i motioned to mother to keep quiet and drove the horse team right in behind them the current is very swift they had all they could do to keep the oxen from going with the current and did not know i had followed them until they came out on an island in the middle of the river hillhouse smiled a sickly little smile and said you should not have tried that dr howard stood near holding his pony by the bridle he complimented me on my skill in driving and said i saw you drive in that swift and treacherous river with bated breath but soon saw that you knew what you were doing yet i rode joe in just behind you to be ready for emergencies thank you for your thoughtfulness i will not halloo until i am out of the woods the other side is to be crossed yet hillhouse said you would better wait on the island and i will come back and drive your wagon over but of course i could not do that after all the complimenting i had received i drove in with fear and trembling for there lay a big freight wagon upset in the middle of the stream it was more difficult than the first side the banks higher and steeper and the water deeper we got over without mishap the doctor came on his pony just behind us i wandered off alone after lunch and climbed to the top of a nearby mountain i found there a large pyramid of loose stones that looked as if they had been piled there by travelers each one contributing a stone i selected a snow-white stone from the mountainside and added to the pile there is another town of wagons being made on the west side of the north platte the wagons have been crossing all day and are crossing yet hundreds of wagons have been driven over that turbulent and rushing river and not a serious accident occurred i have been on lookout for the irvine train but it is not here i think it is ahead of us and we will not see the young ladies or mr reed again on this trip yet as we are all going to montana we may perhaps meet again neely is sick saturday july twenty second we are within sight of pine grove in wyoming territory 
neelie was very much better this morning almost well she said at noon and rode her pony this afternoon i was riding with her when i noticed a heavy rainstorm coming i begged her to come on and not risk getting wet oh no miss sally i don't want to ride fast the air is so delicious and i think i want to ride alone for a while you go on and i will come very soon i saw it was useless to urge her i am always careful not to expose myself unnecessarily to a drenching so i raced on to our wagons and had barely time to unsaddle dick and turn him loose when down came the rain in torrents i was so anxious about neelie and expected her to come tearing through the rain i looked from the back of the wagon and saw her coming plodding along at the same slow gait as if she did not know it was raining when the rain was almost over she came along drenched of course she laughed at my look of dismay and paid no heed to my scolding mother and i both urged her to go quickly and change her wet garments for dry and warm ones she got off her horse and climbed into the wagon when we stopped i went around to see how she fared she sat in the wagon with a blanket shawl around her and the wet clothes had not been changed for dry ones she was shivering with cold oh neelie my precious girl i am afraid you have killed yourself oh no miss sally i am not so easily killed as all that but neelie you have been sick for a week and now to get this drenching i fear the consequences the family do not appear at all anxious so there is nothing i can do but hope and trust that her naturally strong constitution may bear even this strain i advised her to go to bed drink hot tea and get into a perspiration i doubt very much if she will do it milt walker is on the sick list too hillhouse went to bed with a severe headache last night but a night's rest has entirely restored him we crossed three very muddy streams today the first muddy water we have seen since leaving the south platte since coming to the mountains the water has been as clear as crystal until today perhaps we are coming into mining country we stopped quite early this afternoon the mcmahon train has passed and gone out of sight i hope they will not go too far and that they will lend us protection with their portable engine and other machinery sunday july twenty third we are resting today i went with mrs hardenbrook lydie and a gentleman friend of lydie's for a long ramble over the mountains this afternoon we found a most delightful spring where the water seemingly gushes out of the rock just below this spring was a patch of the finest wild onions i ever saw we brought a good supply to camp we are so starved for green vegetables that everyone seems to enjoy the onions though some had never eaten onions before they said for my part I always did like onions. End of section nine. Section ten of Days on the Road Crossing the Plains in eighteen sixty five by Sarah Raymond Herndon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Summit of the Rocky Mountains monday july twenty fourth we passed the summit of the rockies today and are camping on the western or pacific slope tonight the ascent has been so gradual we should not have known when we reached the top but for the little rivulets running in different directions quite on the summit and very near to each other we saw two little rivulets starting on their way 
one to meander towards the pacific while the other will empty its confluence into the mississippi and thence on to the gulf just a scoopful of earth could change the course of either where they started from the same spring really as it is how widely different the scenes through which they will pass so it is with human lives a crisis is reached a decision is made and in one short hour the whole trend of our life is changed with regard to our surroundings associates environments etc we came through bridger's pass today crossed a toll bridge near sulphur springs and had to pay fifty cents toll for each wagon the streams are all muddy that we have crossed today we saw two beaver dams they look like the work of man with shovel and trowel we are camping two miles west of sulphur springs tuesday july twenty fifth we are camping near another muddy creek near a station that was attacked by indians ten days ago they wounded one soldier very severely and ran off with nine horses after we were in corral while waiting for the stove to be set up and the fire to be made i was sitting in mother's camp chair idling and thinking when neely came to me she dropped down upon the grass beside me and laying her head in my lap said oh miss sally i am afraid i am going to be sick in spite of everything and i have tried so hard to get well without sending for the doctor dr fletcher is desperately in love with her and tried to tell her so one day not long ago catching her hands while talking which she resented as a familiarity and has not spoken to him since she told me about it the evening after it happened at noon i told her i believed he was sincerely in earnest and that she had wounded him deeply she told me what she had done to try to cure herself the medicine she had taken is enough to kill her i called mother and told her what neelie had told me mother said you poor child you do look sick indeed you must go to bed and send for the doctor right away i went with her to the wagon helped her to get ready for bed and told cash to send for dr fletcher she said she would as soon as bush her brother came after dinner i went again to see neelie the doctor had not yet come but bush had gone for him i stepped upon the tongue of the wagon and could with difficulty restrain an exclamation of disgust neely interpreted my expression and said cash just would do it said i was looking so like a fright cash had powdered and painted neely's pale face and crimped and curled her hair and made her look ridiculous trying to hide the sick look from the doctor i did not answer neely but went and scolded cash in a low tone she said she was so dark around the eyes her lips blue and her cheeks so pale i could not bear to have dr fletcher see her looking so homely she has told you about their little love tiff yes but don't you suppose he can see through that paint and powder i am afraid he will think neelie did it and she will appear ridiculous in his eyes i saw the doctor coming so came away as i was sitting here writing he came a while ago and said miss raymond will you sit with miss kerfoot tonight and see that she has her medicine strictly at the right time certainly i will is she very sick doctor she is in a much more serious condition than she or the family realize it would not be wise to alarm her but the family ought to know she will need very careful attention i will tell them tomorrow you need not sit up after the last dose of medicine is given which will be at midnight i think she will rest better if everything is quiet and the lights out i know from the doctor's tone and manner 
he thinks neely dangerously ill the doctor gave me directions about her medicine and i went immediately to her wagon sim buford sick wednesday july twenty sixth last evening as i was on my way to sit with neely i met ezra he said miss sally sim is quite sick very much like cousin neely is i think i wonder if we are all going to be sick oh no i hope not i am very sorry sim is sick when i left neely a little after midnight sleeping quietly to come home i noticed a light in the wagon that sim and frank occupy i did not awake this morning until everything was ready for a very early start mother had kept my breakfast warm by keeping the stove until the last minute i sat in the wagon and ate my breakfast after the train had started when through i climbed out and went to see how neely was i found her feverish and restless her symptoms unfavorable oh the dust the dust is terrible i have never seen it half as bad it seems to be almost knee-deep in places we came twenty miles without stopping and then camped for the night we are near a fine spring of most excellent water barrel spring it is called i do not know why there are no barrels there when we stopped the boys faces were a sight they were covered with all the dust that could stick on one could just see the apertures where eyes nose and mouth were through the dust their appearance was frightful how glad we all are to have plenty of clear cold water to wash away the dust neely is no better such a long drive without rest and through such dust was enough to make a well person sick i fear the consequences for both neely and sim for sim is a very sick boy hillhouse told sim last night that we would take him with us and take care of him if he wanted to come and mr kerfoot would let him he wants to come of course so he sent for mr kerfoot this morning to come to his wagon as he wished to see him on business mr kerfoot came and sim asked to be released from his contract to drive through to california mr kerfoot asked why do you want to leave us i believe montana is the place for a young man to go and besides i am very sick and can have better care with the raymonds than i can here for neely needs all your attention i reckon your chances are as good as the rest of us have and walked off frank came for me and i went to see sim he is very sick has a high fever and coated tongue he asked me to see mr kerfoot frank went with me mr k seemed to know what we came for he was scarcely civil i put the case plainly and said we must take care of sim either with or without your consent we owe it to his father and mother and to himself to see that he is taken care of he cannot be taken care of where he is after rearranging the boy's wagon and making room for sim's bed and other belongings ezra frank and hillhouse helped him to the wagon and put him to bed while i went to the mcmahon train which was quite near and asked dr howard to come and prescribe for him the doctor came bringing the medicine with him he says it is mountain fever our train divided the separation of the train is being talked of and is no doubt absolutely necessary for the herd is so large it is hard to find pasture for them altogether when the division is made those going to california will form one corral 
and those bound for montana will form another this will separate us from mr kerfoot's family i do hope we will not have to part while neelie is so sick i do so want to help take care of her thursday july twenty seventh among the families that came into our train at kearney was a family of four young ladies and their father a widower named ryan sue kate mary and maggie are their names mr ryan told some of the young men that he was taking his daughters to the west where there are more men and fewer women so that they could have a better chance to get good husbands than in missouri it has been a good joke among the boys and some of them have tried to be very gallant to the young ladies as they are on the market george carpenter a driver for hardenbrook and walker when the train separated this morning pretended to go into hysterics he had a fit on the inside of the corral when mr ryan drove off with the other half of the train mr kerfoot did not know he was fooling and ran to his assistance the captain passed took in the situation and smiled mr kerfoot knew then it was a hoax and it made him so mad he declared he would not stay in a train where the captain would smile at such conduct the doctor had said to him it is necessary that i see neely several times during the day and you will be taking great risk if you leave the train until she is much better he had decided to stay and join the others any time before they came to the california road west of green river he was so mad at the captain for smiling at carpenter's nonsense and because he did not rebuke him that he made the boys bring in the horses and cattle and hitch up as quickly as possible in an hour after the others started they had followed mr kerfoot did not say good-bye to anyone i do hope neelie will not suffer for his crankiness we are now a corral of twenty wagons the greater number freight wagons they are in corral on the opposite side while the families are all on our side the hardenbrooks walkers bowers kennedys morrisons curries a family of five mr and mrs bailey and their daughter about ten years old and a widowed sister of mrs bailey and her little girl about the same age as her cousin are with us at the back end of the corral i do not know these people only just to speak when we meet but they now help to form our corral we came only two or three miles after the train separated just far enough to get out of the dust mr kerfoot's family and ours have been almost as one family since we have been on the road and i have become greatly attached to all of them and especially to neelie she is the dearest sweetest girl so very unselfish and always ready to help any and every one that needs help there is not one in the family but could be spared better than neelie except of course her father they all love her so and depend upon her for everything she is a precious daughter a darling sister and a true friend sim is very much better he has some fever but not so high a temperature as yesterday dr howard is very attentive he says it is mountain fever that sim and neelie both have dr fletcher called him to see neelie he says she is a very sick girl but not worse than sim was when he first saw him her temperature is not so high i wonder if mountain fever is contagious or what it is that causes it it seems the air is so pure and invigorating one could not get sick at all i never felt better in my life and mother seems so well i am afraid it is the sameness of diet and poor cooking 
that is making mr kerfoot's folk sick the bread they make is hard as brickbats when cold we overtake the california train friday july twenty eighth we came up with the other half of the train about ten o'clock and have traveled in company the rest of the day we have separate corrals about two hundred yards apart the stock is not herded together neelie has been restless with high fever and flighty when she dozes with eyes half open poor girl she is certainly very very sick we are near a delightful spring cold as ice and clear as crystal i went to the spring to bathe my face and hands and brush my hair mr kerfoot and frank came for water mr kerfoot said miss sally why don't you and your folks come and go to california where you started to go why uncle ezra you know the reason we think montana the better place for the boys to get a start and we want to do the best we can for them tut tut wealth is not the chief thing in life you can make a living anywhere and montana is an awful place why the only law they have is mob law and if a man is accused of crime he is hung without judge or jury notwithstanding there seem to be a great many nice people going there and i am not in the least afraid of my brothers being accused of crime i do believe you will regret going to montana and i also believe it is all your doing that you are going i think it is very unkind of you to leave us now when neelie is so sick and needs you so much we are not leaving you mr kerfoot it is you leaving us against the doctor's orders too i made a great mistake saying that he fairly raved he was so angry actually beside himself with rage he said very unkind things without the least foundation or truth in them and which i will try to forget i am so sorry for him i did not answer a single angry word and i am glad i did not but frank did he was about as angry as his uncle was and talked manfully in my defense he gave his uncle the lie and clenched his fists and seemed ready to fight i ended the embarrassing scene by walking away mrs hardenbrook was waiting for me we climbed to the top of a very steep point which was hard to climb and we were out of breath when we reached the top and were glad to sit and rest the view was fine the evening pleasant and we were glad of each other's companionship but we did not talk i think mrs hardenbrook attributed my silence to anxiety about neelie and she was not far from the truth saturday july twenty ninth neelie was very much better this morning her fever gone she was very weak but was free from pain her medicine had the desired effect she had rested quite well last night better than since she has been sick and all her symptoms are favorable the doctor seemed greatly encouraged and told mr kerfoot that if they would stay here until monday he felt sure neelie would be out of danger and they could move on without any risk of doing her harm he did not dream that mr kerfoot would again disregard his advice neelie continued better until noon then someone proposed moving on a half day's drive thought it would not hurt her if they made only short drives at a time mr kerfoot listened and finally consented he is very much afraid of indians and in a few days we will be out of the indian infested country the doctor is very much out of patience with him told me he gave mr kerfoot a piece of his mind you must make big allowance for the poor man 
he does not realize that he is endangering neely's life he cannot believe it possible that such a calamity as neely's death can befall them while he is trusting in a merciful father above yet i do wish someone might have exercised authority and prevented their going sim is very much better improving rapidly mr walker is able to be around once more i wonder if he had mountain fever i have been trying to get the dust out of our wagon this afternoon it was hard work taking everything out and cleaning off the dust lighty walker pleasantly entertained us this evening with songs accompanied with guitar the wagon the walkers occupy is just in front of ours since the separation on bitter creek sunday july thirtieth we came fifteen miles today but have not overtaken the california train it must be that neely is no worse and their traveling yesterday did her no harm or they would have waited over today we shall hope so anyway dr howard rode with me this morning we are traveling on bitter creek which is considered the very worst part of all the road i had heard so much about the desolateness of this part of the country that i expected to find a barren waste it is not so bad as represented there are long distances where there is not sufficient pasture for the stock but in places the feed is plentiful the captain and two or three men are off the road the greater part of the day hunting pasture we stop when they find it at whatever hour it may be monday july thirty first we came twelve miles past one station it was built of stone and seemed a very comfortable place mrs hardenbrook has been quite sick today. i have taken care of little annie we have not had any word from neely i trust that no news means good news sim was able to sit up in the wagon for a while this afternoon i think with care he will be well in a few days we have had delightful weather since we passed the summit the roads are quite dusty but not like they were before we came to barrel springs the water in bitter creek is not so nice as the mountain streams and springs but it is not bitter as i thought it would be from its name tuesday august first we are at point of rocks the place is rightly named one who never saw them could hardly imagine such enormous piles of rock they are as high as mountains with scarcely any dirt among them the sides are smooth and even the stone is soft like slate or sandstone and the whole face of the enormous pile as high as man can reach is literally covered with names dates and places of former residents from all over the united states i looked in vain for some familiar name i left my name in a conspicuous place so if any of my friends look for my name they will not be disappointed there are springs flowing from the clefts in the rock and oh with what pleasurable anticipation did i hasten to partake of the pure water as i of course supposed it was i had been riding with the captain as he came ahead to find a camping place when the train came i rode to our wagon got a cup and crossed bitter creek to get a drink of nice cold spring water i took one swallow oh 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 the horrid stuff i was glad there was no one with me to see the face i made i think i never swallowed a more disagreeable dose it was the strongest sulphur water i ever tasted in my haste and eagerness i did not notice that the atmosphere was impregnated with sulphur and the sulphur formations around the springs because they were covered with dust 
the wind is blowing as cold as greenland i expect we will have to go to bed to keep from freezing mrs hardenburg is no better her symptoms are the same as sims and neely's were at first and we fear she is taking the fever dr fletcher thinks neely must be better or we would have heard as mr kerfoot said he would send back for him if she got any worse End of section ten section eleven of days on the road crossing the plains in eighteen sixty five by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain delayed another day wednesday august second we had a very cold night there was ice quarter of an inch thick this morning several head of hardenbrook's and walker's cattle were missing this morning the men have been hunting them all day they were found this evening in a canyon four miles from camp there were tracks of two horses with shoes that had driven them there the indians do not shoe their horses so there must be thieves besides indians in this country and here we are another whole day's drive behind the other half of our train oh i wonder if it will be possible to overtake them now before our roads separate entirely they must be at least two days ahead of us if they have not been delayed thursday august third the mountains in this region are very barren composed of sand and rock principally it comes nearer being desert than anywhere on the road we have traveled all day and have come only thirteen miles the road has been very rough indeed i rode in the wagon the greater part of the day so i could take care of little annie hardenbrook her mother is very sick i have thought so much about neelie whenever the wheels would strike a rock or jolt down into a rut how she must have suffered if in pain or fever how hard it must have been for her lyde says dr fletcher is very impatient and cross because of the delay he threatened to take a horse and go horseback yesterday when he found the train would not move she thinks he is very anxious about neely and very much in love friday august fourth the wolves howled around our camp all last night and kept caesar our watchdog barking so we could not sleep have made only a short drive and are camping at rock springs where the road forks the men are not agreed as to which road to take the upper or right hand road is the shortest but the lower is best supplied with pasture and water if we take the upper road we cannot hope to see our friends again so dr fletcher and i want to take the lower road for we still hope that we may overtake them mrs hardenbrook is very sick i fear we are going to have another case of serious sickness in our camp i have taken care of annie again today which seems to be the most efficient service i can render as lyde and mrs joe walker take care of mrs hardenbrook when her husband cannot be with her he takes all the care of her at night and a most excellent nurse he seems to be sim is quite well only pale and weak saturday august fifth the decision was made in favor of the lower road as the train was rolling out i had just mounted my pony when dr fletcher came and asked me to ride with him he has never seemed to care for my company nor i for his until since we have been so anxious about neely our anxiety has been a bond of sympathy and we have rather enjoyed each other's society we had gone a short distance ahead of the train when we saw someone coming on horseback i soon saw that it was frank we hurried to meet him he shook hands without speaking i asked how is neely she is very low i came after you doctor 
our camp is about four miles from here we have waited two days for you and thought you would certainly come yesterday when you did not come we thought you must have gone the upper road and i was going back as far as the first station to inquire if you had passed i am glad indeed to meet you but greatly fear you will not be in time to save neelie the doctor asked two or three questions excused himself and rode away at a gallop leaving frank and i to follow while i plied him with questions which he answered patiently he then said neelie was much better for a day or two after we left you we all thought she was getting well she spoke of you every time i saw her and wondered why you did not come since the fever came back i have not talked to her at all part of the time she has been delirious and when conscious she was too weak to talk oh dear i do so want to see her and help take care of her a fatal shooting we rode a while in silence then frank said that is not all the bad news i have to tell miss sally i looked up quickly and asked what else happened frank fraser was shot and killed day before yesterday evening oh frank how did it happen hostetter did it but i think he was not much to blame Frazier is the man who spoke to Cash, Neely, and I, as we were watching the wagons ferried across the Missouri River, whose son ran away from his mother and home to come to his father and go with him to Montana. Frazier had teams and wagons for freighting, and Hostetter some capital to invest in freight to take to Montana. Frazier advised the purchase of flour and he would freight it to virginia city for fifteen dollars per hundredweight he said flour was worth fifty and sixty dollars per hundred in virginia city so it was in the spring of eighteen sixty four and as high as seventy five and one hundred dollars per hundred which was the cause of a bread riot in virginia city no doubt fraser was honest in his advice and would have invested in flour for himself he charged more freight than was right for ten and twelve cents is the prevailing price but then hostetter should have found that out for himself when he found he had been imposed upon and learned that flour is retailing at virginia city for fifteen dollars per hundred he was angry dissatisfied and perhaps quarrelsome fraser was no doubt very aggravating they had quarreled several times, and on the evening of the third, Fraser was heard to say to Hostetter in a threatening tone, You may consider yourself lucky if you ever see Montana. You need not expect to get any of this flour. It will take it all to pay the freight. It was getting dark, and Fraser stood with one hand on a wheel as he talked. He then got into the wagon and out again with something in his hand which hostetter thought was a revolver in the gathering darkness he came back to the wheel where he had been standing when he made the threat and hostetter thought he had come to shoot him and fired twice as he thought to save his own life fraser fell shot through the brain and died instantly then it was found he had a hatchet in his hand and had come to tighten a tire on the wheel which he had found loose when he laid his hand on it fraser's eldest son of fourteen years is here there are five children and their mother at home hostetter has three children and a wife eleven innocent persons to suffer no one knows how intensely for that rash act Frazier's son knelt beside his father's dead body, and, placing his hand on his breast, he swore a fearful oath that he would have but one purpose in life until his father's death is avenged. Oh, what a shocking ambition for so young a boy! Frazier and Hostetter have traveled and camped near us all the way from Plattsmouth. When the train was organized, they came into it, 
when it was divided they went with the others as there were not so many of them and the herd was smaller by the time frank and i had discussed the direful circumstances connected with fraser's death in the presence of this greater calamity neelie's sickness did not seem so sad an affliction as it had before for she is not dead and while there is life there is hope we came in sight of three corrals about eight o'clock camping near together tried for murder everything had a funereal appearance men stood around in small groups talking earnestly in a low voice whittling sticks the incessant occupation of most men when trying to think those with whom we were acquainted bowed as we passed them without speaking i was soon off my horse and ready to see neelie while frank took dick to hitch him for me as i approached the tent where neelie is mrs kerfoot came to meet me how is she aunt mildred i asked anxiously we think perhaps she is better now she is quiet and resting easy but she has had a very restless night and the doctor says she must be kept perfectly quiet not the least excitement she had led me away from the tent while talking i saw in a flash what she meant i was not to see neelie after we left you she kept asking about you and when you did not come we thought perhaps you had gone the short cut and so we told her you had gone the short cut to montana and we would not see you any more she seemed grieved at first but became reconciled to what could not be helped and now if she should see you of course it would excite her and i know you would not do anything that might harm her or make her worse oh no of course not emma delia and judy had come to where we were talking i kissed them all said good-bye and came away with a heavy heart i unhitched dick and leading him by the bridle went on in advance of the trains selected a place for the corral unsaddled dick and waited for the wagons i did not have long to wait and the captain was so good as to corral on the place i had selected i had a motive in being in advance of the other trains i hoped to get hill house and mother to consent to pull out of corral and go on if the train did not move we are not in any danger from indians now and we can go on alone if no others choose to go with us i cannot bear to stay here and not see neelie we could not move to-day but hillhouse says we will to-morrow morning the men from these four trains selected judge jury prosecuting attorney and lawyer for the defense and have tried hostetter for murder the jury brought in a verdict of not guilty he shot in self-defense as fraser had threatened to kill him hillhouse served on a jury the first time in his life he is only twenty they buried fraser yesterday lyde and i visited his grave this afternoon hostetter seems very remorseful blames himself for being so hasty sunday august sixth we were up bright and early this morning by the time other camps were at breakfast we were ready to start one other family with us mr curry his wife and four boys when hillhouse spoke to the captain about our going on he said he thought it advisable as our teams are in good condition the cattle not at all lame we can make much better time than the train can as so many of the cattle are lame they will be obliged to travel slowly there is no danger from indians and after we reach green river pasture will be plentiful without going away from camp to find it i climbed into mrs hardenbrook's wagon to tell her good-bye kissed little annie as she was sweetly sleeping mrs h seemed sorry to have us go 
i met dr fletcher as i was leaving mrs hardenbrook and asked about neely she is very low indeed of course while there is life we may hope but if she lives they will have to stay here a week or ten days i did not tell him we were leaving but said good morning and went to find lyde she was worried and anxious about milt he has been staying behind the train to drive lame oxen almost every day since he has been well enough he is usually in camp by ten p m last night he did not come she said brother joe is quite sick too i wonder what will happen next oh lyde no very serious calamity has happened to you or yours nor me or mine let us not borrow trouble but hope for the best milt will be here in a little while i know he is able to take care of himself and he is going to do it we leave the train the wagons had started so i mounted dick and was off as i came into the road i looked back and saw milt coming in sight driving his lame oxen i left the road once more and went to fraser's grave his son has set it with prickly pears so closely that it will make a pretty mound if it grows and will be a protection from wolves unless their hides are thick and tough poor boy he must have been seriously scratched while transplanting the prickly things but perhaps it was a relief to his mental suffering to bear physical pain while trying to do a last something for his poor father i spent a dreary morning i feel the parting with our friends so distressingly it is not likely we will meet again in this life i think sim is feeling blue over it too we met a squad of soldiers from green river going to arrest hostetter and take him to fort bridger for trial they say his trial was not legal he and all the witnesses will have to go by the way of fort bridger and will perhaps be detained for some time i do hope for his own and his family's sake he will be cleared the upper road from rock springs goes by the way of fort bridger i think for the soldiers spoke as if it was not on this road we arrived at green river about three o'clock the river is about as wide deep and swift as the north platte yet i have not dreaded any of the rivers we have crossed as i did dread to ford this one perhaps it was because there are so few of us for in numbers there is a feeling of security even in crossing deep and dangerous streams we crossed without accident or loss and are camping on the west bank of green river when we first came to the river one of mr curry's boys exclaimed well this river is named right if i had been going to name it i believe i would have named it green river too for it is green the water is very clear yet the river has a bluish green appearance i do not understand why there are several corrals along the river but the people are strangers so we feel very much alone there is a station here and soldiers tents within sight we are camping on blue grass with the mountains very close they are the highest i have seen i would like to climb to the top but mother says there are too many soldiers and strangers around at the foot of the mountain a little way from our camp there is a graveyard with about a dozen graves it is a beautiful spot with the mountain for an enduring monument several of the graves have been made this year with names and dates quite distinct on the plain pine headboards others are entirely worn or washed off by the relentless hand of time and storm it seems that bitter creek was too much for the weak or frail constitutions like moses they were permitted to look upon the better land before they died monday august seventh the soldiers brought hostetter here in the night 
and I suppose the witnesses came too. I wanted to go to the station to see if I could hear anything from Neely and the rest of the sick folks, but Mother did not want me to go where there are so many soldiers, so I did not go. We started very early this morning and have driven about 20 miles. We are camping on Black Fork, where the horses and cattle are just wading in fine pasture right around camp. We ascended a mountain this morning that was seven miles from base to summit, the way the road is. We had toilsome climbing, and I guess the teams found it a hard road to travel before we reached the top. I came on in advance of the wagons, sometimes riding and sometimes leading Dick where it was very steep, and had time to enjoy the magnificent scenery that lay spread out on all sides. The snowy range could be seen in the distance, glittering in the morning sunshine. The wild currents are here in abundance. I am going fishing with the boys, so I must be off wild currents galore tuesday august eighth we caught fish enough for breakfast last evening and gathered currants enough for sauce but i spoilt the sauce by putting the sugar in when i put them on to cook they hardened and were not fit to eat i have been experimenting today and have succeeded in making a nice cobbler i did not sweeten at all before baking but made the sauce sweet enough to sweeten all. I also made a fine sauce by cooking the currants only a very few minutes and putting in the sugar after they were cooked. We will have currant dumplings for dinner tomorrow. I have picked a lot, enough to make sauce and pies and other good things for a week. The currants are a beautiful fruit, and some are as large as small cherries. We are waiting at Camp Plentiful in the hope that some of the wagons from the train will drive in before night. There are three wigwams within sight of our camp. Sim and Hillhouse went hunting today. On their way back, they stopped at the wigwams and found them occupied by white men with squaws for wives. Ugh. End of section 11. Section 12 of Days on the Road, Crossing the Plains in 1865 by Sarah Raymond Herndon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wednesday, August 9th. Somehow I felt a little suspicious of those white men living with squaws and feared some of our horses might be missing this morning. But my suspicions were groundless. Our horses and cattle were all here, well fed and ready for a long drive. We were off bright and early without seeing anyone from the train. We passed the Bridger Road, where our friends going to California will turn off. So we are not likely to see them again, perhaps for years, perhaps never again in this life. There is a very fine ranch at the junction of the roads where we stopped at noon. Two men from this ranch visited our camp this evening. They were rather fine-looking, genteel in appearance, dressed in civilization style, but for some unexplainable reason I was afraid of them. They tried to be very cordial and polite. They engaged Sim in conversation and plied him with pertinent questions such as, who owns those big American mares, referring to our horse team? They are the property of a widow. Whose bay pony is that? It belongs to the widow's daughter. Who is the owner of that chestnut sorrel? Mr. Curry, father of those boys playing over there. They asked many more questions. Where we came from, where we are going, what we expect to do, etc., sim answered them patiently and civilly he thinks they are horse thieves but hopes they will not be mean enough to steal from a widow as if horse thieves care who they steal from no doubt their ranch is stocked with stolen horses and cattle 
for they have things as they choose away out here where there is no law except the law of might god's word says as the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool jeremiah seventeen eleven we are camping on ham's fork where the currants and fish are very plentiful and the pasture very fine we had our current dumplings for dinner they were lovely no one can imagine how we appreciate this fruit by the wayside except those who have been deprived of the strawberries raspberries blackberries and cherries each in their season and confined to the sameness and tameness of diet which people making this trip are necessarily confined to this fruit would seem inferior among other cultivated fruits but where it is it seems a luxury provided for our benefit thursday august tenth we went fishing at noon it is such fun to fish in water so clear that we can see the fish biting at the hook they do not seem at all afraid and sometimes there will be two three or four grabbing at the hook at the same time such shoving pushing and crowding as they all try to get the tempting bait how eager and unsuspecting they are soon the strongest or fleetest or rather the most unfortunate one seizes it away goes bait hook and all and then out comes a fish on dry land i give a shiver of pity for the unlucky fish as i call to the boys i have another it does seem such a cruel thing to take them from their pleasant home in the deep clear cool water but then life is sustained by death and thousands upon thousands of lives are taken daily to nourish and sustain human life we are in a beautiful place where all things necessary for camping are plentiful and we are all alone no corral within sight the first time we have been entirely alone friday august eleventh one or other of the boys stood guard last night it proved an unnecessary precaution there was no disturbance either from horse thieves indians or wild beasts we are living fine since we crossed green river we have fresh fish for breakfast and sometimes for dinner wild game of some kind for dinner with currant pudding cobbler or dumplings with rich cream for dessert we may possibly go hungry next winter at virginia city but there is no danger of starving while we stay on ham's fork the weather is perfect i have been riding my pony the greater part of the day sometimes one of mr curry's little boys with me and sometimes alone i have enjoyed the delightful atmosphere it seems so pure and invigorating the scenery is beautiful and it has been a glorious day mr curry's horses stolen saturday august twelfth it was considered unnecessary for anyone to stand guard last night as we had come two days travel from where the suspicious characters live so all went to bed retired early slept soundly and even neglected to put caesar's rug in its usual place under our wagon so he went into the tent with mr curry's boys to find a comfortable bed leaving the camp entirely unguarded one of our big horses wears a bell i was awakened in the night by hearing an unusual rattling and the horses came galloping up to the wagons dick whinnied i raised the wagon cover and spoke to him and he commenced cropping the grass the other horses were in sight but not eating they seemed frightened and just then caesar came tearing out of the tent and ran toward the road barking fiercely the moon was shining brightly 
i looked out at the back of the wagon but could not discover anything wrong but evidently there was something wrong for mr curry's horse was gone this morning mr curry sim and hillhouse have been hunting the horse all day but without success except to find certain evidence that it had been stolen they found the campfire where three horses had been tied for some time they then found where four horses had traveled so they concluded there were three men after the horses the boys think it was the merest accident that our horses are not gone too but i believe it was providential care that kept them for us mr curry is anxious to stay and try to recover his horse i believe as the boys do that it will be a waste of effort for if men are mean enough to steal a horse they will manage to keep it but we do not like to offer too many objections as it might seem like selfishness on our part as we are not the losers oh dear why don't people be good and do as they would be done by how much happier this world would be if there were no thieves nor wicked people in it i know it is hard for mr curry to give up his fine horse without making an effort to get it back yet i feel sure he will not get it for if he found it he could not force the thieves to give it to him anxiously waiting at ham's fork sunday august thirteenth it was decided this morning that hillhouse sim and mr curry would go in pursuit of the horse thieves sim is just recovering from a serious sickness and is not able to go on such a trip but he positively refused to stay in camp and let hillhouse and mr curry go without him i believe it will prove a wild goose chase so mother and i exacted a promise from hillhouse that he will not stay away tonight. we are looking for him it is getting dark surely they will not leave us here in this wilderness with only two boys and caesar for protection if we are left alone i shall take my turn with winthrop and alex curry standing guard in camp sim rode dick this morning the others walked what they expected to do if they find the thieves which they are not likely to do i do not know mr and mrs kennedy mr and mrs bower nellie and alton and mr grier's teams passed here to-day they left the train the next morning after we did the train had not started then they said neely was about as when we left and mrs hardenbrook was no worse monday august fourteenth hillhouse came in about an hour after dark he was very tired and hungry had walked since early morning until he started back at three o'clock he tried to prevail upon sim to return and to let him go on with mr curry if he must go but sim would not listen to such a proposition although he is still weak from his late sickness mr curry thinks he will find his horse at the ranch near the junction although the trail they were following led away from instead of toward it if he finds it he will go back to the train and get the men to help him get it either by fair means or by force he then proposed that they keep dick but they said he would not reach camp before midnight on foot and he might lose his way but dick would take him the shortest route if he would just let him go his own way which he did and he brought him safe about an hour after dark i am so sorry for mrs curry she tries to be brave for her children's sake but any one can see she suffers and alex says she does not eat at all just takes a cup of tea once in a while tuesday august fifteenth another day has come and gone and the wanderers 
have not returned hillhouse said he did not expect them today but would look for them tomorrow for they will not have anything to eat after today and will be obliged to leave the foothills and come to the road whether they find the horse or not to get something to eat a party of emigrants stopped near us today at noon and one of the men came to our camp we of course asked if they had seen the hardenbrook train they passed the train sunday they were still where we left them at the west end of bitter creek he saw and talked to the captain who told him to tell us if he caught up with us the sick folks are all better and they expect to come to green river monday they may catch up with us yet i do not know what we would do with ourselves if it were not for the currents we are making jelly and as it takes lots of currents to make a little jelly we have not suffered from enforced idleness with our suspense and anxiety wednesday august sixteenth there are three varieties of currants here the yellow ones are not very plentiful they are the largest and best i have made a pickle jar full of the loveliest jelly it is the color of gold and as clear as crystal the red currants are very plentiful and more like the tame currants though they do not yield as much juice we gather the bushes by the armful and carry them to camp and sitting near each other we pick off the currants though we do not talk much we like to be near each other another day and they have not come and another night of anxiety before us the wanderers return thursday august seventeenth i was awakened very early this morning as soon as it was light by hearing hillhouse bustling about making a fire in the stove as if in a hurry for his breakfast i dressed as quickly as possible and hastened out to see what it meant for it was only four o'clock when i asked for an explanation he said i am going to hunt those men i can't stand this any longer i have laid awake almost all night thinking about them what can you do you will be lost yourself no danger of that i will go back on the road as far as green river and get some of the soldiers and some of the boys that know them and we will hunt until we find them or know what has become of them i may meet them on the road and return to-night but i will not come until i bring them with me or know their fate i could not object to his going but oh how my heart sank at the thought we made all haste to get breakfast and hillhouse was all ready to start when mrs curry and the boys came out mrs curry seemed both glad and sorry he was going said she hardly knew which i had supplied him with pencil and paper and he promised to send us word every opportunity he mounted dick and rode away without saying good-bye he had gone almost out of sight one moment more and a bend in the road would hide him from our view when lo there is a gun fired not far off i thought was indians and i looked to see if hillhouse was hurt he was waving his hat furiously and came tearing back to camp then i heard mrs curry cry out oh it is my husband and she dropped in a heap on the ground and cried out loud they were plainly visible by that time coming over the hill and down to the creek and through it before anyone could show them where they could cross without getting wet all was excitement for a while the meeting between mr curry and his family was very touching indeed i think mrs curry had about lost all hope of ever seeing him again how famished and worn out they did seem to be sim was utterly exhausted i do not believe he could have gone another half mile 
we gave sim a bowl of bread and milk and a cup of coffee then the boys helped him to bed in our wagon because it is on springs and we expected to start before he waked within one hour after they reached camp sim was sleeping the sleep of exhaustion we did not ask any questions nor let him talk at all before he went to sleep mrs curry prepared the best breakfast the camp could afford for her husband and as the family had not breakfasted they all sat down together she came for sim to take breakfast with them but he was sound asleep and i would not have him awakened for the best breakfast ever prepared perhaps mr curry can stand eating such a meal after starving so long but i believe it would kill sim in his weak condition for he is not fully recovered from his recent illness we made all haste to start once more and by eight o'clock were on the way we had left the camp where we spent five such anxious distressful days sim did not awaken until after ten o'clock we gave him some fish and bread and milk which we had ready for him when he had eaten he lay in bed and told mother and i the following narrative of what had befallen them since they left camp sim's story of their wanderings after hill left us that first afternoon we walked on as fast as we could as long as we could follow the trail then made a fire ate some supper without anything to drink we had not seen water since noon we rolled up in our blankets and lay down with our feet to the fire and tried to sleep i am sure i did not sleep an hour i was so tired and nervous as soon as it was light enough to see we were up and ate a dry breakfast for we could find no water in the vicinity we were soon following the trail before night we had eaten all our grub and found no water oh what i would have given for a cup of cold water it seemed that we must find water or perish we dragged on as long as we could see then lay down and slept from exhaustion when we awoke it was light i was so weak that mr curry had to help me to get on my feet i declared i could go no further mr curry prevailed on me to try for we must be near green river i made a desperate effort and dragged on for half a mile perhaps mr curry carrying my blanket when i positively could go no further and told mr curry to go on and leave me and try to save himself mr curry was desperate he said i must find something to eat he covered me with the blankets and went to look for some kind of game. When he had gone about a hundred yards, he saw a bird about the size of a partridge sitting on a limb ready to be shot. He took careful aim and shot its head off. He hastened back to where I lay, made a fire, skinned the bird, and held it on a sharpened stick before the fire and roasted it thoroughly i would have eaten it when half done but mr curry would not let me have it until well cooked for fear it would make me sick i never tasted fowl that tasted so good as that did although we ate it without salt after eating i felt better and made another effort to move on we had gone only a little way when mr curry stopped listened a moment and exclaimed there hear the rushing of the river i could not hear it at first but soon i heard the glad sound too it gave us courage and with renewed energy we pushed on and before eleven o'clock we reached the river we slacked our thirst cautiously at first then had a bath and were refreshed while i rested on the bank mr curry looked up and down the river for the trail which had gone into the river he did not find it we then started for the road which we came into in about an hour just below the ranch at the junction a party of emigrants had stopped for noon who
who gladly gave food and refreshment to us weary wanderers while i was resting mr curry investigated the ranch looked among the horses in the pasture peeked in stables but did not find his horse after mr curry had given up getting his horse he was all eagerness to get back to his family but considering how very weak i was he consented to stay with the kind people we had fallen in with until morning so we traveled with them and i rested in a wagon all afternoon at the first peep of dawn mr curry was up and awakened me i felt refreshed and ready for our early walk mr curry explored the grub box found some bread and meat which he appropriated leaving greenbacks to pay for our entertainment we expected to reach camp by ten o'clock p m but i gave completely out and we were obliged to lie down and rest when about five miles from camp i slept until awakened this morning before it was light by mr curry who was so anxious to be on the way i wondered that he let me sleep so long we came over the foothills instead of by the road and saved about a mile in distance we saw hill riding away from camp and felt sure he was starting to try and find us mr curry fired his gun to attract his attention and you know the rest he turned over and went to sleep again and slept until we stopped for noon we made a long drive today and are camping at the foot of bear river mountain we had a hard rain and hailstorm this afternoon it was very violent while it lasted and we halted by the roadside until it was over it was over in half an hour mr curry has suffered with severe headache and high fever all day the result of that hearty breakfast this morning after fasting so long End of section 12. Section 13 of Days on the Road, Crossing the Plains in 1865 by Sarah Raymond Herndon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bear River Mountain, Friday at noon, August 18th i am on the summit of bear river mountain in the border of a beautiful grove of pine and quaking asp near a spring of the most delicious ice-cold water i must be some miles ahead of the wagons that i left toiling up the steep mountain side yet i do not feel i am alone oh no i feel that god is here in his might majesty power and glory I feel his nearness now, and as I gaze from these dizzying heights upon the country spread out beneath my feet, I am lost in admiration. The scene is so grand, so magnificent, that I forget my own vanity and nothingness. I feel that I am standing upon an altar raised by nature's grateful hand up to nature's God, and that I could offer myself a willing sacrifice this is emphatically one of the high and sacred spots of earth how manifold how wonderful are the works of nature everywhere something worthy of our highest admiration is presented to view everywhere do we see the manifestation of an invisible and omnipotent creator the terrific storm the broad prairies the majestic forest excite within our bosoms emotions of awe and admiration yet there are no places on earth that i have seen which have a tendency to inspire me with such tender feelings such elevated pure holy thoughts as mountains oh it seems that one could never sin or have an evil thought in such a place as this behold the mountains as they stand upon their broad bases contemplate them as they rear their snowy tops in awful majestic grandeur above the clouds view them as you will 
and day ever present the same untiring pleasure to the mind men and women will travel thousands of miles and make the greatest exertion to climb the rugged steeps of mountains to enjoy for one short hour the charming prospect i have wondered at this sometimes as i have read of their hazardous exploits in trying to obtain a point where they could have the finest view but i never shall again a country destitute of mountains may be fertile and productive of all that conduces to human happiness yet it will lack the essential of attractive moral grandeur it may enchant the imagination for a moment to look over prairies and plains as far as the eye can reach still such a view is tedious and monotonous it can in no wise produce that rapturing delight that pleasing variety of the sublime and beautiful of landscape scenery which mountains afford let those whose tastes are on a level with the ground they tread feel proud of and admire their prairie fields but give to me a mountain home the wagons are almost at the top and as mother has driven up the steep ascent i will drive down the western slope and have mother ride dick and enjoy the delightsome scenery as we descend the mountainside which looks very steep from here we were all the evening crossing the mountain and it was a hard drive we are camping at the foot of the mountain near a spring in bear river valley within calling distance of the chillicothe train we passed two freight wagons on the mountain side that were rather badly smashed up one had upset and crackers in a broken up condition and other debris from family groceries were scattered about we learned that the wagons are dr yeager's and he has gone somewhere to get the wheels mended we are quite disappointed that he is away for sim is not so well as he was yesterday has had fever and been flighty and in a stupor this afternoon he needs medical treatment and we hope to have dr yeager prescribed for him we passed eight graves on the mountain one a young lady twenty years old from monroe county missouri a beautiful resting place for the dead mrs yeager is quite sick and seems sadly disheartened thinks crossing the plains and mountains in a wagon they have a very comfortable carriage is a sad discouraging never to be repeated experiment i am sorry she could not enjoy the fine prospect on the mountain top for she is a lady who would appreciate such grandeur to the fullest under favorable conditions we reached level ground without accident and were glad to come up with friends we had met before on the road we meet captain hardenbrook's brother saturday august nineteenth we left the chillicothe train this morning as it will take all day to get the wagons mended they cannot start today. we came on to bear river reached here a little afternoon and will stay here until tomorrow we crossed a toll bridge on smith's fork and met captain hardenbrook's brother at the bridge he is going to meet the train he did not know of mrs hardenbrook's illness he asked very especially and with some confusion is miss walker well ah i think i know who he is going to meet and understand some things that have not been very clear to me before aha miss lighty you have guarded your secret well but see if i have not guessed it now well he is very nice looking and if he makes as good a husband as his brother he will no doubt be worth coming to montana for i wish you joy and that i may be present at the wedding festivities the boys have gone fishing all but poor sim poor boy he is too sick again i feel very much out of patience with mr curry 
because of the tramp he led Sim in when in so weak a condition. Sunday, August 20th. We passed a grave this morning that was made yesterday for a young mother and her newborn babe. Oh, how sad! With what an aching heart must that husband and father go on his weary way, leaving his loved ones by the roadside. We crossed another toll bridge. It seems to me that emigrants are greatly imposed upon by these men who claim toll. They throw a very poor excuse of a bridge across a stream that could be easily forded if left alone. But they spoil the crossing by digging ditches and throwing in bush and timbers to obstruct the fording, then build a cabin close to the bridge and squat to make a fortune by extorting large toll from immigrants who have not the time to stop and contend for their rights it seems a shameful business while stopping at noon we saw a company of indians coming down the road toward our wagons my first sensation was fear but upon reflection i knew that is not the way they go on the warpath and by the time they reached the camp i was ready to say how and try to talk to them there was one that could understand english and talked quite well they are bannocks the tribe that was conquered in idaho some years ago their chief was with them he held a stiff neck and tried to look dignified and only looked ridiculous they are going on a buffalo hunt it seems that the whole tribe are going squaws papooses and all we have been meeting them all afternoon and are camping with them all around us tonight. They all seem to want my pony. I have been asked at least twenty times this afternoon to swap. I gave all the same answer, no swap. Why, I would not give my dick for twenty of their ponies. The squaws and papooses are around our camp tonight, begging biscuit. They are the greatest beggars I ever saw. I do wonder if they are hungry. We crossed the steepest straight up and down mountain today that we have crossed yet. It seemed that the wagons would turn a somersault as we were making the descent. Sim was too sick to sit up, and he would slide down in a heap, bed, bedclothes and all, against the seat and grub box. We stopped twice to have him helped back into place when we reached level ground he was all piled up again poor sim he is very sick i do wish we would come across a physician we have administered simple remedies but seemingly without effect there is an old lady ninety-three years old in a train camping near us tonight she is cheerful as a lark sings sometimes and is an incessant talker she says she is going to oregon where she expects to renew her youth she looks very old and wrinkled in the face but is very active in her movements and not at all stooped the people she is with are not at all refined or cultured but i do like to talk to the old lady she is so quaint it makes mother seem quite a young woman to see her with an old lady more than forty years older than she is. Why, she seems just in the prime of life, and we had thought her growing old. Mormon Towns in Idaho Monday, August 21st Since we crossed the last steep mountain, the horseflies have been very troublesome the first that have bothered us all summer. I wonder if the Indians brought them. We came through two villages today that are about five miles apart, the first Bennington, the last Montpellier. Pretty large names for such small places. They are Mormon towns, although this is Idaho territory. The women appeared sad and sorrowful enough to be the wives of Mormons. I did not see one of them smile. 
our wagons were thronged with women and children selling butter eggs cheese and vegetables they sold eggs at seventy-five cents per dozen butter seventy cents per pound cheese fifty cents potatoes twenty-five cents and everything else in proportion the prices seemed enormous to us but i presume we would have purchased if they had been double what they were for we are about starved for such things just think of spending a whole summer without garden productions this is a beautiful valley too good to be possessed by a community of bigamists what a stigma upon the government of these united states that whole communities are allowed to live criminal lives with impunity i wonder how many are paying the penalty for bigamy in the penitentiaries of the united states what is crime in one place under the same government i would think would be crime in all other places if the one did happen to be an isolated case while the other is in large numbers or wholesale i suppose i am not well enough versed in law and politics to understand why it is a crime in one place and not in the other we are camping eight miles from montpellier sim is much better today tuesday august twenty second here we are at soda springs i am surprised to see so small a town for it is quite an old place for this western country at least ten or fifteen years old and does not have a post office the town is beautifully situated the landscape views are glorious the soda springs are bubbling up out of the ground in many places in this vicinity and i expect there will be a city here some day there are medicinal springs here that possess wonderful curative properties or people think they do we wanted sim to test them but he said i am getting well as fast as possible and i don't care to drink that nauseous water i prefer the pure unadulterated snow water from the mountain springs this is the junction of the oregon and montana roads there are three camps within sight of us wednesday august twenty third as we drove into the road this morning there was a train of eight wagons came into line just behind our wagons and have traveled with us all day stopping at noon when we did and they are camping near us tonight though we have separate camps they are from missouri and are going to virginia city they seem to think as we all came from the same state and our destination is the same place that of course there is a bond of fellowship that is mutual but to be frank i must confess i do not care to go into a strange place in their company for i fear we will be judged by the company we keep and i think it would not be very favorable so we will try to get away from them as soon as possible the weather is perfect this is a beautiful valley the men say the land is extremely rich we are camping on the blackfoot we have not been able to shake our missouri friends we meet men returning to the states thursday august twenty fourth we came to a toll bridge over the blackfoot this morning for the toll was one dollar per team and fifty cents for horseback riders there had been an excellent ford just below the bridge the men collecting the toll had spoiled it by digging ditches on both sides near the bank the water was clear and they were plainly visible hillhouse mounted dick to see if we could ford it one of the men screamed out to him you will mire your horse if you try that i'll risk it and he rode in below where the ditches were dug the pony's feet were not muddy hillhouse found we could easily ford the creek below the ditches which we did without accident it does seem a shame that we should have to pay toll 
for crossing a stream like that after fording south platte north platte and green river the missourians refused to pay the exorbitant price and offered them fifty cents per wagon they swore they would not take a cent less than one dollar but the travelers were too many for them and they drove over and did not pay a cent the toll men were fearfully angry and made great threats but the men dared them to do their worst and laughed at them i do hope we will get ahead of these people tomorrow they are not the kind of people i like to travel with we have met as many as twenty men today going back to the states from the virginia city mines george mays was with them i mentioned about his leaving the train to go through on horseback expecting to get his meals at stations and emigrant trains when his brother with his bride went to colorado says he worked just one day and got five dollars for it and took the back track the next day mining is the only work a man can get to do and it would kill an ordinary man in less than a week he is distressingly homesick he is going to denver to his brother friday august twenty fifth we were up at the first peep of dawn had breakfast and were hitching up to start when the folks in the eight wagons began to emerge and light their campfires so we have left them some distance behind we have been meeting men all day returning from the mines they give a doleful account of the hard times in montana they say there are a few fortunate ones who are making money like dirt but they are the exception about one in a hundred one man was very anxious to buy dick i told him this pony is not for sale and rode away before he could say anything more the boys say we have met as many as two hundred men today returning from the mines i believe we are all somewhat discouraged this evening we have always heard such flattering reports about adler gulch and virginia city friday august twenty sixth we have overtaken mr grier mr bower and mr kennedy some of mr bower's cattle have eaten a poisonous herb wild larkspur i believe it is one ox has died and several are poisoned but will not die they got the poison weed the day before yesterday when they stopped at noon i am glad we have overtaken them but sorry for their misfortune hillhouse has just now come in and says joe one of our big white oxen is poisoned he came for remedies and to sharpen his knife to bleed him no doubt he got the poison the same place mr bower's cattle did when we stopped for noon sim hillhouse and winthrop have gone to his relief mother and i save joe's life later the boys came back very much discouraged after working an hour and said the blood will not flow and he is swelling frightfully i fear he will die for when the blood will not run and the animal begins to swell they cannot be saved mother said we will not let him die without further effort at least come on sarah let us try what we can do for him we melted a quart of lard and put it in a long-necked bottle that we had brought for the purpose of drenching horses or cattle cut up a lot of fat bacon into strips put on our big aprons and taking a bucket of cold water we were ready hillhouse said don't give him water i answered you never mind who is doing this we were not long finding poor joe he seemed to be suffering dreadfully his nose was as hot as fire it actually burned my hands when i took hold of it to drench him with the lard he seemed to know we were trying to help him 
and did not resist at all when i put the bottle in the side of his mouth to pour the lard down his throat he looked at us with his great soft patient eyes in such a docile knowing manner i felt sure he would not bite me so i put my hand away down his throat to make him swallow the strips of fat bacon he swallowed them as patiently as if he knew what they were for we then bathed his nose with the cold water without letting him drink any and before we came away he seemed relieved and the swelling had stopped and he breathed much better i believe he will live End of section 13section fourteen of days on the road crossing the plains in eighteen sixty five by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain saturday august twenty seventh joe did not die this morning when hillhouse went to see about him expecting to find him dead he was grazing and seemed as well as ever except his nose which looks as if it had been scalded we came to snake river ferry this morning six miles from where we camped last night we paid eight dollars for our outfit crossing on the ferry as nellie bower and i were standing on the bank of the river watching the wagons being ferried over holding our ponies by their bridles a gentleman came near lifting his hat and bowing politely he said to me i will give you one hundred dollars in clean gold dust for that pony this pony is not for sale sir at any price we came from the ferry about two miles and stopped for lunch i told hillhouse what the man said if i were you i would certainly sell him so many seem to want him he will very likely be stolen oh i can't sell my pony after lunch the men folks went to fish in snake river they had been gone but a few minutes when the man that wanted dick rode into camp he rode straight to our wagons and said i will give you one hundred and ten dollars for that pony i had begun to relent somewhat I felt that it would not do to be sentimental under existing circumstances. We had spent almost all our money for toll, ferrying, and other expenses on the road. It might prove to be a serious matter to be in a strange place without money, and if we fail to get employment, we will be obliged to sell something. And there is nothing we can spare so well as Dick i knew the man had offered all and more than i could expect to get for him but as hillhouse was gone fishing and i could not think of selling my pony myself i said to the man my brother is not here and i cannot let him go tell your brother to bring him to the ferry and i will send you the pay for him i think you need not expect him for i am sure he will not come he went away without dick and hillhouse did not take him back so i have my pony yet we came five miles and camped as too long a drive is not good for the poisoned cattle i wish there was a longer distance between us and the man that wants my pony mr grier sold his riding horse at the ferry he says there is a party of half a dozen gentlemen going to the state's horseback they are all supplied except the man that wants your pony he has waited trying to find a horse with an easy gait and dick is the only one that has suited him oh he will be back again miss raymond and make another offer and if you do not let him have him i don't know what he will do for he seems determined to get him if he does come i will not dare to refuse him but i do hope we are out of reach of temptation 
Dick is as fat as when we started. I comb and brush him every day, and he shows his keeping. He always looks nice and sleek. He is a bright bay with heavy black mane and tail. Dick is sold. Oh, dear. Sunday, August 28th. It was scarcely daylight when that hateful man was here again after Dick. I had just finished dressing when Hillhouse came to the wagon and said, Shall I let Dick go? Do as you think best. And I threw myself on the bed for a good cry. I had not stopped crying when he came back, and throwing a buckskin purse into my lap said, There is your pony. There was one hundred and twenty-five dollars in gold dust in it. I sobbed out loud. Hillhouse looked at me with contempt in his expression, but said nothing. I could not help crying. I know he would never sell anything that he loved, and I love that pony. I let the purse roll out of my lap down into the bottom of the wagon, and have not touched it yet. Of course, I knew the wagon bed was tight, and there is no danger of its being lost. We came to Silver Lake today. We are having a fine shower of rain, which we were needing very much. It was some time coming, so we had dinner over and were ready for it when it reached us. Monday, August 29th. We have traveled today over Snake River Desert nothing but sand and sagebrush we watered at noon at a toll well called hole in the sand and paid ten cents a head for watering stock i wonder what we will have to pay toll for next we are camping on camel's creek there is a family camping near us from bannock going to the states the lady is a sister of mr Esler one of the court's kings of Montana, so she says. I presume everybody knows about him. But I must confess I never heard of him until now. His sister is taking his motherless babe back to its grandmother. Mr. Esler's wife died more than a month ago. The babe is about four months old, and as sweet as can be. I could not keep my hands off it and that is how I came to get acquainted with its auntie. She is a great talker, seems to think I am going to Montana husband hunting, and volunteered a great deal of advice on the subject. Especially, I must not tell that I am from Missouri, as Missourians are below par in Montana. She is from New York. Oh, dear it makes one tired to see a full-grown woman so frivolous tuesday august thirtieth we watered the stock at noon at hole in the rock didn't turn them out to graze as there was nothing for them to graze on mr bower has lost another ox and was obliged to buy a yoke of oxen to get his wagons over the ranges there are two mountains to cross before he reaches his home in the Madison Valley, fifteen or twenty miles the other side of Virginia City. Of course, he had to pay a most exorbitant price. Joe, our ox that was poisoned, seems as well as ever, except his nose has peeled off as if scalded into a blister we are camping at the foot of the last range we will cross before we reach our destination. Mrs. Kennedy and I have become quite well acquainted the last few days. She was a bride of only a few days when they started to the west. Her husband drives one of Mr. Bower's teams. They are going among strangers to make them a home and fortune. She is a very intelligent and well-educated young woman. I do not know her husband very much. Mother's Birthday 
Wednesday, August 31st. Mother's birthday. She is 53 years old. We have not been able to celebrate it especially. Yet she is not likely to forget it, though spent in climbing a rocky mountain range. We have been now four months on this journey, have lived out of doors in all sorts of weather. It has been very beneficial to mother. She was looking frail and delicate when we started, but seems to be in perfect health now and looks at least ten years younger. I have not heard her utter one word of complaint, either of physical suffering or outward discomfort, such as the heat or cold, mud, dust, rain, nor any of the things that make camping out disagreeable and so many people grumble about. What can't be cured must be endured, is her motto, and the one care has been that we all keep in good health, and she would ask nothing more. We are camping in Pleasant Valley, a depression right on top of the mountain, just large enough for a good-sized ranch. It is a beautiful place. The scenery is magnificently grand. There is a fine grove of beautiful trees at the lower end of the vale. The sides and upper end are hedged in by straight up and down hills or mountain sides about 15 feet high. The grass is a luxuriant green and very plentiful. There is a station here occupied by a family that used to live in Virginia City. They have two very bright little girls who have spent the early evening hours with us. They are perfect little chatterboxes to talk. They have a married sister living in Virginia City, the wife of a Mr. Wheeler, who is a candidate for some office. The little girls had forgotten, whether for sheriff or member of Congress. Thursday, September 1st. This is Brother Mac's birthday. He is 27 years old. I wonder if he has thought of it and remembered us. I presume he has. It has been some weeks since we have had an opportunity to post a letter to him. There have been depredations by the Indians, which have no doubt been largely reported in the newspapers, and he cannot know that we have escaped. His anxiety and suspense must be hard to bear. I know I should suffer agonies were our circumstances reversed. As we were descending the mountain, we met a freight train loaded with people returning to the States. After we had passed them about half a mile, Hill House was walking in front of the wagons and found a miner's shovel. It is bright and shining, but not new. It is worn off some. The men tell Hill House it is a good omen that he will make money by the shovel full. He laughed and said, I reckon I better keep it then to shovel it up with. Friday, September 2nd. When I awoke in the night, I heard the rain pattering on the wagon cover. This morning, the mountains were all covered with snow and presented a magnificent picture. Those nearest our camp are covered with pine trees of an intensely dark green. The snow on the boughs and beneath the trees glittered in the sunshine. The scene was constantly changing as the warm sun melted the snow from the boughs and before night it was all gone except on the highest peaks where it stays all summer the roads have been sloppy and muddy today though the water has all run off or evaporated so that it is comparatively dry where we are camping notwithstanding there was so much snow and water on the ground this morning it is too cold for comfort this evening we are hovering around the stove with our shawls on. Sweet Water Canyon Saturday, September 3rd We came through a deep, dark canyon this morning, 
and passed the grave of a man that was robbed and murdered last week it is the deepest and darkest canyon we have traveled through ten men have been robbed and murdered in it in the last two years we were in no danger of being molested only men who have their fortunes in gold about their person are intercepted robbed and killed how awful it seems why will men be so wicked in several places in the canyon the road has been widened with pick and shovel perhaps two or three days work done and we had to pay ten dollars toll for our two wagons passing over it we stopped at noon on black tail deer creek our camping on the sweet water about twenty-five miles from virginia city this is a beautiful place there are fine large trees along the creek high mountains around a lovely dale it is just large enough for a fine farm there is a deserted cabin here where someone commenced improving a farm became homesick and discouraged and left it for someone else sunday september fourth we are camping within seven miles of virginia city near a freight train of about fifty wagons with from seventy-five to one hundred people all together men women and children returning to the states to hear these people talk of the disadvantages and disagreeable things with regard to life in montana would have a tendency to discourage one if it were not so palpable that they are homesick and everyone knows that when that disease is fairly developed everything is colored with a deep dark blue and even pleasant things seem extremely disagreeable to the afflicted person the ladies seem to have the disease in its worst form and of course they make the gentlemen do as they wish which is to take them home to mother and other dear ones we have had a very pleasant day about as pleasant as the day we started on this journey the first day of may it is cheering that the first and last days of our journeying should be so lovely after four months and four days of living outdoors we are all in the most robust health yet we shall be glad to have a roof over our heads once more even if it is a dirt roof monday september fifth noon here we are camping in the suburbs of the city in alder gulch where the miners are at work how i wish my descriptive powers were adequate to making those who have never seen gulch mining see as i see and realize the impression made upon me as i first looked into the gulch at the miners at work there is a temporary bridge very shaky across the gulch that wagons may pass over standing on this bridge in the middle of the gulch looking up and down and even beneath my feet the scene is a lively one so many men it seems they would be in each other's way they remind one of bees around a hive and such active work it seemed that not one of that great multitude stopped for one instant shoveling and wheeling dirt passing and repassing each other without a hitch it made me tired to look at them the ground is literally turned inside out great deep holes and high heaps of dirt the mines are said to be very rich two p m we dined at noon today had beefsteak at fifty cents per pound and potatoes at twenty five cents i do not know if the price had anything to do with it but it certainly tasted better than any i ever ate before i interviewed a woman or rather she interviewed me 
that lives near where we are camping she said her name is Nehart. her husband is a miner and earns seven dollars per day judging from the manner in which they seem to live they ought to save at least five of it i presume i did not make a very favorable impression for after i came back to camp she called across the street to her neighbor so we could hear what she said some more aristocrats they didn't come here to work going to teach school and play lady with great contempt in her voice i laughed at the first impression made and tried to realize that teaching is not work end of section fourteen section fifteen of days on the road crossing the plains in 1865 by sarah raymond herndon this librivox recording is in the public domain the end of our journey mrs curry sim hillhouse and i are going to town as soon as mrs curry is ready we held a council whether we should get out our street suits and last summer's hats or go in our emigrant outfits sunbonnets and short dresses thick shoes and all decided in favor of the latter no doubt the people of virginia are used to seeing emigrants in emigrant outfits and we will not astonish them evening we were not very favorably impressed with virginia city it is the shabbiest town i ever saw not a really good house in it hillhouse and i after hunting up and down the two most respectable looking streets found a log cabin with two rooms that we rented for eight dollars per month mrs curry did not find a house at all we thought as so many were leaving there would be an abundance of vacant houses but there were enough living in tents to fill all the houses that were vacated mr curry's folks and mr kennedy will go to helena mr bower has a ranch on the madison valley mr grier will stay here for a while anyway the cabin is on the corner of wallace and hamilton streets next door to the city butcher the cabin has a dirt roof there is a floor in it and that is better than some have it is neat and clean which is a comfort men have not batched in it we found quite a budget of letters at the post office the most important of which are from brother mac and frank kerfoot mac's letter cincinnati august tenth eighteen sixty five dear mother sister and brothers it is with fear and trembling that i pen this letter i have not heard from you for more than a month telling me you had decided to go to montana the papers are full of accounts of indian depredations i have realized to the fullest extent that hope deferred maketh the heart sick in your last letter you had decided to go to virginia city so i will direct this letter to be held until called for i am glad you are not going any further west i cannot conceive why you wanted to go to that far off wild western country i do wish you had stopped at omaha or st joe or even denver it would have been better than montana with sincerest love to all your son and brother mac but oh the sad sad news comes in frank's letter neely is dead oh the anguish of soul the desolateness of heart that one sentence gives expression to frank's letter green river wyoming territory august eighteenth dear miss sally i write to tell you of our very great sorrow precious neely is gone we are all sorely bereaved 
but how uncle ezra's family can ever get along without her i cannot see any member of the family except uncle could be spared better than neely she got very much better and the doctor said if uncle would stay there another week he was sure neely would be well enough to travel without danger of a relapse but if she had another relapse she could not be saved the hardenbrook train left monday morning mrs hardenbrook was much better the gatewoods and ryan stayed with us neely was much better she sat up in bed some that night uncle ezra did not sleep at all he was so afraid of indians the next morning as neely had a good night's rest and was feeling stronger nothing else would do but we must move on to green river where the soldiers are we started about nine o'clock and drove twenty-five miles without stopping it was very hot and dusty uncle drove the family wagon and watched neely carefully after a time she seemed to be sleeping quietly so he thought she was all right but it was the sleep from which there is no awakening in this life dr howard and dr fletcher were both at green river and they both worked all night trying to arouse her but without success at early dawn neely's sweet spirit took its flight and we are left desolate miss sally do you remember carpenter the young man that made uncle ezra so mad by pretending to go into hysterics when the ryan girls were leaving the train when he heard that neely was gone he went out on the mountain and found a large smooth flat stone white as marble but not so hard and engraved neely's name age and date of her death on it to mark her resting place he worked all day upon it and at the funeral he placed it at the head of her grave and if you ever go over this road it will not be hard to find neely's grave we gathered wild flowers and literally covered her grave with them darling neely our loss is her gain for we all know that she was an earnest devoted christian we will start on our now sorrowful journey tomorrow i wish you were here to go with us but hope you will be successful where you are and happy too mrs hardenbrook was much worse after they came here that hot dusty drive was hard on well people for sick people it was terrible when neely died she was very low but she has rallied and the rest of the train will move on tomorrow but mr hardenbrook will stay here with his wife until she is entirely restored and they will go to virginia city on the coach i'll send love to you all aunt mildred asked me to write you very sincerely your friend frank i believe i am homesick this evening it is so dreary to go into a strange place and meet so many people and not one familiar face but i must not complain for we are all here not even caesar missing my heart aches so for the kerfoots i do not know how they can bear this terrible bereavement under such trying circumstances tuesday september sixth mr curry's folks have started to helena mr bowers to the madison valley and mr kennedy with them to drive his team leaving mrs kennedy with us until tomorrow when they will take the coach for helena we moved into our cabin this morning it does not seem as much like home as the wagons did and i believe we are all homesick if we would acknowledge it the boys found a checkerboard nailed on the window where a pane of glass was broken out we pasted paper over the place they made checkermen out of pasteboard 
and sim and winthrop are having a game hillhouse is reading the montana post mother is making bread and initiating mrs kennedy into the mysteries of yeast and bread making as hillhouse was on his way to the butcher shop he passed an auction sale of household goods the auctioneer was crying a beautiful porcelain lamp he stopped to make the first bid one dollar he called there were no other bids and he got the lamp his first purchase in virginia city he has it yet when he brought it home with the meat he went to get mother said what is the use of the lamp without a chimney so he went to purchase a chimney after dinner and coal oil to burn in the lamp he had to pay two dollars and fifty cents for a chimney and five dollars for a gallon of coal oil so our light is rather expensive after all and thus ends our first day in virginia city and brings crossing the plains and mountains in eighteen sixty five to an end by s r h afterward a letter from dr howard reminiscences of the plains by dr howard editor husbandman through your kindness to mrs howard we are a reader of your excellent journal hence a few months ago our eyes fell upon reminiscences of pilgrimage across the plains in eighteen sixty five by s r h and at once recognized the writer as the lady who rode the gallant bay and now sir as we were a humble member of the gallant mcmahon train frequently referred to in her interesting journal permit me through the columns of your paper to tender her the thanks and gratitude not only of ourselves but every surviving member of that train for affording us the pleasure of again traveling that eventful road without the fatigue and hardships of a long and tiresome journey and even now after the lapse of fifteen years to be so pleasantly reminded of our gallant bearing and the confidence reposed in us for protection while passing through the indian country we almost regret that the savages did not give us a striking opportunity of displaying our prowess it was our pleasure to form the acquaintance of the writer as correctly stated on the north bank of the south platte near the foot of fremont's orchard the present editor of the husbandman then a beardless youth had been suffering with typho malarial fever from the time we left nebraska city and we visited her camp ostensibly begging bread and obtained as good as was ever baked upon the plains from this time on at least for some hundreds of miles it was our pleasure to meet her on the road and in camp we were in different trains but camped near each other every night for protection from the indians very soon somehow or other when our trains were preparing to drive out every morning and miss r was mounting dick we were in the act of mounting our pony joe and even at this day in thinking over the matter i am induced to believe that our ponies became somewhat attached to each other as they would instinctively fall into each other's company this was the state of affairs existing at elk mountain where the bouquet was gathered and presented and where it is frankly admitted we became somewhat partial well do we recollect the crossing of north platte that turbulent stream on the fort halleck route train after train was crossing all day long we were standing on the bank with captain mcmahon when the hardenbrook train the one in which she was traveling approached the crossing and we discovered miss raymond on the front seat of the wagon with lines in hand in the attitude of driving we remarked good gracious look yonder 
is it possible miss raymond is going to drive that team across this terrible stream alone now said captain mcmahon is the time to show your gallantry and before we could think twice she drove bravely in of course we mounted joe and followed after her and here on a little island in the middle of the river is where we rode up and congratulated her on her skill as a driver as we approached the place of our destination our trains became separated miss r preceded us a few days to the golden city it was our pleasure however to visit her in the little domicile mentioned in her narrative and talk our troubles over our journey through at last and in her happy presence we forgot the gloomy past we sojourned in virginia city but a short time then crossed a tributary of the missouri river near their confluence and wintered at diamond city confederate gulch the june following we returned to our native state a year after our return captain mcmahon and myself received cards announcing the nuptials of miss raymond and mr herndon which cards now occupy receivers on our centre tables for which we were ever thankful and at which time of course the bouquet crumbled to dust and now wishing the lady who rode the gallant bay and the lucky gentleman whose home she makes happy long life and the enjoyment of a montana home i am truly yours w howard end of section fifteen and end of days on the road crossing the plains in eighteen sixty five by sarah raymond herndon read by sue anderson